If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. What's up, Mind Pump listeners? So me, Adam, and Justin had the amazing opportunity to sit down and have a great conversation with Chris Cresser. Now, uh, for me personally, um, I have a, a special connection to Chris. Back when uh, I started having uh, gut issues and health issues, his articles were the ones that really directed me or really helped me, I should say, find the right direction to help myself. In the wellness world, uh, Chris Cresser, um, he's among the best. His information is incredible. He's got some, some phenomenal books. He's a functional medicine practitioner. He looks at the entire body as one organism. In this episode, we have some great conversation with him. Uh, we ask him a lot of good questions. We talk a lot about the state of health in this country. We talk about you know diets and why we crave certain foods and uh, you know uh, everything from leaky gut syndrome to HPA axis dysfunction to adrenal fatigue. It's a really, really good episode. He is one of the experts uh, in this realm, so you're going to love this episode. Um, now, you can find... His information at chriscresser.com. That's Chris, say C H R I S, Cresser, K R E S S E R.com. He also has a book that's about to come out. Now, we were lucky enough to get a, an advanced copy of it. I'm already halfway through it. Brilliant book, one of my favorite books. The title of it is Unconventional Medicine Join the Revolution to Reinvent Healthcare, Reverse Chronic Disease, and Create a Practice You Love. It should be available either by the time this airs or within a few days. So go check it out. Um, he also has a podcast, Revolution Health Radio. So without any further ado, here we are talking to Chris Cresser. Chris, I think I first heard about you, It's God, it's got to have been at least six or seven years ago, maybe longer. I had a client um, that I was working with who had just some strange uh, issues with fatigue, just chronic uh, fatigue, had issues with food. She was developing more and more issues with different foods that she would eat where she would get reactions like bloat or digestive issues or skin issues. And um, she talked about you and I looked you up and then I read, I think I read an article that you wrote about leaky gut syndrome and what that is. Um, and we've talked a little bit about leaky gut syndrome uh, to our audience, uh, maybe if you if you wouldn't mind explaining that a little bit and what that is and how common that is, because I think uh, since learning about it, I feel like it's far more common than people realize. Sure. Yeah. So our gut um, is basically, if you think about it, it's kind of interesting. Everything inside of our gut is technically outside of our body. Um, oh yeah, it's, it's think about weird. That. It's, yeah, it's weird to think about yeah, it because we think about it as Wait, inside. Sorry, explain yeah, that yeah, to yeah, me. All right, let's just do it okay. over. Our heads. You know, <laughs> here's, here's how I imagine. I imagine it like this: uh, like you have a donut, uh, and then there's a hole in the donut, right? Inside the donut would be in the donut. The hole is not in the donut because it's that's through. Exactly right. And that's what your that's where your digestive or, system is. It's like a hollow tube, you know, that connects your mouth to your anus, basically. I got it. I got it. And so saying. anything that's in that tube is not really in your body yet. Wow. Uh, okay. Wow. So it's just shuttling through. Yeah. And mm. that it's helpful to think about it that way hmm. because then you start to understand one of the main purposes of of the gut barrier, hmm. which is to keep things out of the body that shouldn't ever get in. You know, some things we put in our mouth that we're not supposed to absorb. That's why they come out the other end. <laughs> right? But some things we need, like nutrients and food. And so the gut is this barrier system that decides what gets in and what stays out. And so it should normally be permeable, but only at the right time mm. and for the right things. Mm -hmm. And leaky gut is what happens when it becomes inappropriately permeable. So it starts letting things in that should not get into the body in the first place. So these could be big protein molecules that haven't been broken down. They could be toxins from bacteria in the gut if there's like an imbalance of good and bad bacteria. And then when those things get into the bloodstream, they trigger an inflammatory response and all hell breaks loose. So it can cause everything from digestive symptoms, clearly like you mentioned, Sal, but also skin breakouts and rashes because skin's the biggest organ in the body and inflammation will almost always affect it. 
So you got kids with acne, you know, adults with acne, eczema, psoriasis, all that stuff can be gut related. It can also cause depression and anxiety because there's a profound connection between the gut and the brain. So unfortunately, most doctors, most people in the general public don't really know about this. The, the connection between the gut and all of the rest of the body. It, you, it used to be uh, people used to la- laugh at leaky gut syndrome, just the mm-hmm. word, you know, just the term, yeah. like that's bullshit. It doesn't exist. But it seems like more and more people are now starting to accept, uh, you know, accept that that's something that can happen. How far along is Western medicine in this regard? Are they acknowledging it at all, or is it just right now in the study phase? Oh, well, that's an interesting question because, yeah, it's true. I mean, if if you wanted to generate some serious eye rolling, you know, <laughs> or like get yourself laughed out of a room 50, 20 years ago, you go to a medical conference and start talking about leaky gut, you know. Mm. It was like the realm of alternative quacks. And now if you go to PubMed, which is the big repository for scientific studies, and you search for intestinal permeability. See, you have to use the very official sounding term. <laughs> then you'll see thousands of studies, literally thousands of studies connecting intestinal permeability with, with everything from autoimmune disease to depression to schizophrenia. So it's a legitimate condition that's being studied in peer-reviewed, you know, prestigious scientific journals. But whether that research has actually trickled down to the average primary care physician is a different question. Mm. And this is one of the biggest problems in medicine right now is there's at least a 20 to 30 year lag time, it seems, between like the cutting edge research and then what what becomes the standard of practice. Mm. What are some of the main causes? Why are we having so many issues with our guts, you know, uh, today? What's causing this? Well, in a nutshell, the answer would be the modern diet and lifestyle. So, you know, we human beings, just like all other organisms and animals in nature, we evolved in a certain environment and we're adapted to survive and thrive in that environment. And when you take us out of that environment and put us in a really different one, our genes can't change fast enough to adapt. And so we have things like processed and refined foods, you know, big gulps and cheese doodles and um, you know, all the, the crap that we eat today, that stuff will cause intestinal permeability. We've what is got, it, Chris, in those that are causing that? What is it? What is it? Sugar, refined flour, um, the, all of these things cause what we call dysbiosis. So it feeds, you know, potentially harmful microbes in our gut and allows them to proliferate. And then that, the toxins that those bacteria produce can cause that intestinal is, permeability. Is it because it's just like, a, it's an overwhelming amount for the gut to handle at one shot? Is that what it is? Because we've refined it so much and we've processed it so much that it's just like this yeah. bomb going off in our gut? Yeah, I mean, if you to, to put it simply, like if you think about what our ancestors ate, it was all real nutrient-dense, whole, unrefined food. It was, it was you know, meat and fish, wild fruits and vegetables, some uh, nuts and seeds, and some starchy plants. And what these foods all share in common is they don't have a lot of, um, easily accessible sugar in them. I mean, they have the fruit has some sugar, but it's locked up with fiber and there's a lot of water. And so um, when we eat these foods, our body knows what to do with them. When we eat the, you know, uh, the top six foods now on the American diet are um, grain-based desserts, bread, pizza, sugar-sweetened beverages like colas, alcohol and chicken dishes, but mostly fried chicken nugget, you know, like chicken nuggets and KFC. Those are, those six foods comprise the majority of what people eat. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean. The new food pyramid. The new yeah, food. Good. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, you're, and you're saying that that is Yummy. making us sick? That's weird. Oh, isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. I mean, who knew? So, I mean, it's, it's kind of fun sometimes to think about the evolutionary adaptations we'd have to go through in order to, for, to thrive on those six foods being the part of our diet. I mean, they're totally depleted of the nutrients that we need, like the micronutrients, the vitamins, minerals, trace minerals, that's like fuel for the car. You know, if you don't, if we don't have that, we can still function, but we're not going to function very well. It's like putting diesel in a car that runs on gasoline. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it'll still go, but it's, it's not going to work well. Mm. And so, yeah, those, uh, those foods are, are, they have a lot of, um, sugar Mm -hmm. that's readily available and so they that sugar feeds the microbes bacteria love sugar just as much as we do and in fact we know that those bacteria can actually cause us to crave sugar 
they're, they're actually kind of running the show when it comes to our cravings. So if we have more of these bacteria, they can Which, make us crave Isn't that another that. controversial thing to say, too? Because some people's the whole craving thing is, is uh, I remember when we had Lane on the mm. show, that was his mm-hmm. big, he, I said, well, man, I get these cravings when I eat these foods. And he, oh, we're careful with what you use, what you say when you say the word crave, like, you know, is is that kind of like a gray area? Like what? Well, I, I mean, there's certainly plenty of research that shows that the gut microbiome affects our cravings because the chemicals that the bacteria produces affect our brain, and our brain is what determines our cravings for food. Mm-hmm. We have this system, um, the hypothalamus and other regions of the brain that basically determine what you know what we seek out, and that that's a survival mechanism that you know when we were living. In, when we were hunter gatherers, it was a survival advantage for us to seek out sweet and fatty foods because you know if we obtained those we would survive. Yeah, you know pack that, it on. that that's great. But when there's a Seven Eleven on every corner, and we can just walk down to the end of the corner and get that a big gulp and all kinds of other stuff, that's where that hardwired programming starts to work against us. Right. Mm-hmm. There's also, um, you know, when when we did seek those things out, uh, at some point we have these these natural systems where our we'll actually get sick of a particular flavor. It's like a natural satiety signal. So, like if I were eating something sweet in nature. Um, I could eat so much of it, but there'd be a certain point where I'd be like, I don't want to eat anymore. We, we've all experienced that. Yeah. But when I introduce a new flavor to it, I kind of hijack that signal and it and, and it, I'll eat more. And what happens a lot of times, this is what I talk about a lot this on the show. This is the show. magical science behind McDonald's fries and ketchup, exactly. right? That's exactly Exactly. Right. And this yeah. is what I, I like to talk <laughs> so about tasty. on the podcast a lot of times is how food manufacturers of these processed because processed foods really what they are is just highly engineered foods yeah there's lots and lots of money and science that goes into figuring out the perfect uh, texture you know crunch or whatever the taste the saltiness the sweetness the color the smell like all the all the factors that go into making a food desirable and then also overcoming your body's natural systems of satiety so that you eat more of them. It all goes into processed foods, whereas natural foods, you know, we evolve to kind of where our bodies will stop eating when they need to or crave them when they need to. Whereas with the processed food, that doesn't really happen too much. Yeah, there are a couple good ways I like to talk about this that make it pretty clear for people. If if you imagine two plates, uh, and on one plate you've got a baked potato with no salt or butter, just steamed plain baked potato, um, it, it's pretty hard to overeat that, right? You'd probably eat it if you're hungry, but right. you're not just going to keep eating once you're satiated. Then you imagine a plate with potato chips and it's pretty pretty, <laughs> you know, pretty easy to imagine overeating those, you know, even once you're still, you're full, you're still eating because it's hitting all of those reward signals that mm. you just mentioned. Another example is that Rob likes Rob Wolf likes to talk about. I know you guys have talked to him before. The porn um, industry. <laughs> yeah, well, he loves to go that direction, right? <laughs> there, there is that. That's not the one I had in mind, but um, I know you guys uh, have this book here on the table. Maybe that's it's on uh, our mind. <laughs> yeah. So um, it, he was he ta- he. There's a video he actually links to. It was this uh, contest where it was like who could eat the most ice cream. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but so this guy's eating this like just disgusting amount of ice cream. It makes me sick. <laughs> it was the, it was the kitchen it. sink. <laughs> yeah, it was like a full one. kitchen sink full. Yeah. And he's getting to the end and you can see him start to flag. Like he's getting green and it Ugh. almost looks like he's going to throw up. And how does he actually finish this? Orders a large order of fries. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Salty, you know, crunchy, totally different reward circuits. He eats the fries and then he's able to go back and finish the ice cream. So that's, Variety is one of the most powerful Mm -hmm. uh, signals for that food reward system. And this is one of the reasons why, if not the reason why, I think the whole, you know, watch your calories, watch your proteins, watch your fats, watch your carbohydrates model fails because it doesn't take these root systems into account at all. Um, And so when when you're sitting there trying to restrict yourself, but you're not, you don't understand how these natural systems of satiety, hunger, reward systems work, then you're you're fighting an uphill battle. And then it's just your willpower 
versus your body's natural desires and yeah. guess one guess which one's going to win eventually yeah you know it's not going to be a wi- your willpower no so I, i'll tell you i mean there's some phenomenal ways to put this into practice for losing weight it's just that nobody will do them <laughs> <laughs> so one is we could just call the really boring diet. You know, <laughs> where, where, sounds where, awesome. Where, yeah. It's not going to be a bestseller. Is that your next <laughs> no, okay. I don't think so. The boring um, diet. The, the really Write boring that down, diet that doesn't taste good. You know, you, oh, you, it's even better. you, you yeah. just you eat like a few. You choose a few you, simple foods. You don't eat a lot. You don't add a lot of seasonings. You don't add fat so if you have you know steamed broccoli you just have it alone without salt or fat on it and then you have a simple you know like a piece of meat or fish it's just very simple and then maybe even a starchy plant you know like a potato or sweet potato with with not you guys are salivating i can I see mean, it. Yeah. <laughs> loving it over there yeah. i know you're all it's so, invigorated right no i mean if people ate that way they would not it would be almost it would be very difficult to gain weight and it'd be easy to lose weight and there's the potato hack have you guys heard of this no potato hack no it's a, it's actually one of the most successful strategies for rapid weight loss you eat nothing but potatoes for you know, three to That's five people did for days. A while, not by <laughs> yeah. choice. Yeah. Not by choice. Exactly. <laughs> and you don't put butter and, you know, olive oil and chives and sour cream and bacon bits on it. You just eat the potatoes and you cook the potatoes. And people are like, wait, isn't that going to tweak my blood sugar? You know, I'm all eating all these simple carbohydrates. You generally, you cook the potatoes in advance so you don't have to cook the potato every time you eat it. And when a potato is cooked and cooled, it forms resistant starch. So this is a type of starch that's not digested by humans, um, so it doesn't impact your blood sugar the same way that eating a potato would oh, interesting. normally. Huh. And it actually feeds your beneficial gut bacteria, which is one of the reasons it might be beneficial. But generally, people can lose like a half a pound a day eating this diet. You just, you just sold oh, the hell man. out of that diet, yeah. by the way. <laughs> and, and, and the reason it works is for exactly the reason you're talking about. It's almost impossible to eat more plain potatoes than yeah. you're actually hungry for. It totally short circuits that reward system and you eat only what you're hungry for and maybe not even that because <laughs> you're so tired of potatoes. And you don't have to do it forever. You know, you just do it like there's different ways of doing it. Some people do three days a week and then the other four days they eat normally. There's a variation called potatoes by day where people eat potatoes <laughs> in the morning and at lunch. And then they have a normal dinner, you know, paleo That's type of dinner. Yeah. And I'll, t- I'll tell you, it's one of the most effective ways for people who will do it in my practice. I, these are the people who've tried everything else and it doesn't work. They're not usually just going to start with this. Yeah. Yeah. Is this easier for, do you find than like, having people fast as opposed to that? Uh, often. I mean, it depends on the person, mm. but, um, I would think so because you're getting something. Yeah, you actually fasting yeah, something. takes some discipline. You're getting and- something you're eating. It may not be exactly what you want to eat. It's super easy from mm. a time perspective. You just, you know, bake, 10 potatoes on Sunday, but you know, <laughs> or whatever it's going to be for the yeah. week. And then, you, oh, man. and then you just eat the potatoes. So, I mean, like I said, it's, I'm, I'm, I realize not everyone listening to this is going to go out and, you know, rush to do this. Not an ideal it, but, diet, but, but I but think it's what a good example. Point, yeah. The point you're making very, very well made because I think the, the old paradigm of the hunter gatherer or how we used to eat was that we were constantly starving and that's why nobody ever you know that's why now we have food in front of us so now we just overeat and i don't think that's necessarily true i think it's the body not only did it evolve uh surviving with not having food but it also had to evolve so that we didn't overeat when we did find food because every once in a while we would make a, a successful hunt or we would you know come upon a field of you know plants or whatever and overeating would have been just as dangerous as under eating, we could become sick. We could damage our, our guts even then. Uh, we could cause problems, which will then affect our survivability. So these natural systems of satiety that we have, we still have them. We've just hijacked the fuck out of them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we become, I'll, I'll, become extremely disconnected from ourselves. Totally disconnected. Yeah. Yeah. And the point you made about the bacteria driving our behavior, you know, it's funny when people laugh at that because really if you <laughs> – First off, we probably have more bacteria cells than human cells in our body. We've mm-hmm. evolved, we've co-evolved. It's a symbiotic relationship. We can't survive without each other for uh, for very long. Um, so it only makes sense that our behavior is going to be influenced by our host, which outnumbers our cells. But we've also got evidence of this. They've done uh, functional MRI studies on people where they've 
mapped out their brain and how it's operating. Then they'll give them probiotics. And then the the way their brain operates will kind of change a little bit yeah. after taking a particular type of, you know, strains of bacteria. Yeah. We also know there's examples of, and I can't, uh, there's a, a type of bacteria that uh, rats and mice can pick up um, from, I believe from cat feces, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> and what this bacteria does is it makes the mice and rats seek out uh, cat urine and be less afraid of cats, mm-hmm. almost as if it's, it's, it's like forcing the, mo- the mouse or, or rat to get eaten by the cat to start the whole cycle yep. over again. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so, and this is proven, this is proven. Yep. So to think that we're somehow immune from being influenced by our bacteria is absolutely yeah. ridiculous. I, I totally agree. I would point out though, that even in nature, there are examples of, of people getting exposed to highly rewarding foods and over and that system being overrided or overridden. Um, the Aceh in, in Paraguay are like a hunter-gatherer people there, and they will go to extreme lengths to obtain honey. You know, they'll climb trees, mm. which they fall from and die. You mm. know, they'll get stung by hundreds of bees. And then when they get the honey, they'll consume up to two liters at a time. Oh, shit. Yeah. Liters of just, honey. Just hoarding Can you it. imagine that? That's, That's a, a lot of honey. I mean, man. they don't have any conception of what's healthy or not healthy. Like they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're not on the low carb diet. Oh, there's <laughs> honey there. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm in my cyclical keto phase. So I'm going <laughs> to skip that. I gotta you know? wait till Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. No, they just eat it. You know, yeah. it's like, it's there and it's available and they're going to eat it while they can. Um, so even in nature, that's how powerful these, these reward signals are. And, in the difference is in nature, what do you have to do to get that honey? You know, exactly. you gotta climb a fifty foot tree and risk falling and get stung by hundred bees. It's not like Amazon Prime, you know, <laughs> like just show up at your door in two days. I just came up with a new diet. This is what you do if you have donuts or whatever in your house. Right. Set up some traps, put some bees in front of it, yeah. and go through an obstacle course and then yeah, you have to climb a mountain. Come in there and yeah. poke you with needles yeah. to simulate the yeah, exactly. bee sting. It'll yeah. be right up and then on the other end it's just potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> That's all you get is potatoes at the end. Oh, damn it. I guarantee weight loss. Right. <laughs> Boring guarantee. diet wins. So I'm, I'm reading a, a book called Subliminal right now. And uh, how much, Chris, do you think uh, a lot of this stuff is driven from the, the hijacking and the processed foods and chemicals? And how much of it do you think is driven from like behavioral, like from when we were children, like your, your mom or dad handing you an ice cream because, you know, you did something and rewarding you with foods and stuff. How yeah. much do you think, obviously they both play a role. How much do you think each? I think that probably depends on the person. It's really difficult to quantify an exact percentage in general. I mean, some people did learn in their childhood to use food as a way of suppressing difficult emotions or, you know, re- as a reward system or whatever. Um, but, you know, for other people, that's not really that big of an issue. And it's more just a, a question of these reward uh, mechanisms that we've been talking about, which everybody is susceptible to. Mm-hmm. I don't care who you are. Right, right. You know, you, and, and this is what happens when you take a hunter, you know, hunter gather group of people and you expose them to modern diet. They're not like, oh, I'm sorry, that's not on my, you know, my hunter gather diet. They'll eat that stuff and they'll eat it. Um, liberally and they'll start to acquire all the diseases of civilization as they do that. So I tend to think these hardwired biological mechanisms are primary for most of us. Mm-hmm. And then you layer on top of that some of the stuff that you talked about and it's a it's a it makes it even worse. It's a shit storm. Mm-hmm. I felt like yeah. I felt like all the years that we've trained thousands of clients that we've trained, the ones that really struggled with weight had the combination of both. Right. Yeah. Like if you were hundred plus pounds overweight, it wasn't just you getting chemically hijacked. You were also had some sort of attachment to food in a bad relationship and the combination ended yeah. up with this disaster. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And genes do play a role. I mean, I, I often say genes load the gun and environment pulls the trigger. Mm. Well, the, keep in mind that you can pull the trigger a lot, but if it's not loaded, it's not going to make a difference. Mm. So genes do play a role. Um, and I think it mostly determines like, I mean, we all know the person who just eats like crap and, and doesn't exercise and they're still, you know, lean and they mm-hmm. don't have a problem. And then we know the person who does everything right and is still overweight. And that, you know, that a lot of that does come down to genetic predisposition. That doesn't mean that you don't have responsibility or there's nothing that you can do about it, but it is worth pointing that out. You know, I also mm-hmm. think it's important to note that uh, fat gain is one symptom 
of uh, it's one of many symptoms that can happen uh, when it comes to you know poor uh, poor nutrition or you know bad lifestyle in that in that sense because there's a, a, a big chunk of people who get diabetes or die from heart disease have are not overweight. Many of them yeah. are of, of normal or, weight. Or, or have get autoimmune issues or like psoriasis like myself, but never once struggled with weight my entire life. Well, yeah. autoimmune issues, and it's kind of nobody really talks about, but it's that is an exploding epidemic yeah. uh, in, in modern Western societies. And that is the one thing that we have such a tough time treating uh, with our you know, Western medicine, you know, uh, strategies. Yeah, I mean, one way I think about this is I have a pretty simple heuristic for talking about chronic disease. And it's just, if you think about like a math equation, you have genetic predisposition plus modern lifestyle equals chronic disease. Mm. You know, I think it really is that simple. But the type of chronic disease you get is mediated by that genetic predisposition. So you take 100 people um, hunter, hunter gatherers, let's say, uh, who've never been in, exposed to the modern lifestyle, you expose them to it, they're not all going to develop the same problems. You know, 10 people will get psoriasis and eczema and skin problems. Another 10 people will get some different autoimmune disease. Another 10 people will develop Alzheimer's and dementia. Mm. Another, you know, 20 mm. people will develop cardiovascular disease and metabolic problems. And this is, this is why we see this panoply of conditions in our society. But what we don't emphasize or get is that they all come back to that same equation of mm. modern lifestyle plus genetic so the triggers are, yeah the triggers towards, are all the same yeah, the but they manifest differently and that's mm. one of the biggest problems with conventional medicine we see all these diseases like separate things we're, we're, we're locked up in in doing research to find drugs that will address the the ultimate manifestation you know mm -hmm. we'll we'll fix the skin problem or we'll, we'll you know alleviate the depression or we'll lower the blood sugar or whatever, we're looking at it from the outside in. We should be looking at it from the inside out right. instead. So that's more functional medicine you're talking about. Could you like describe to our audience, like, you know, what, what really is functional medicine and how are you addressing like these problems with the Western way of doing it? Yeah. So, you know, our, our, our healthcare system, I like to say, is not, it's not really healthcare. It's better. We should probably call it sick care. Or, or disease management. Because what we typically do oh, is that's a good, better name. We, we wait for people to get sick, <laughs> sick mm -hmm. and then we try to, uh, you know, give them relief from the symptoms by primarily using drugs, right. right? I mean, let's face it. The average visit with primary care practitioner now is 10 to 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after you get done saying hello and, you know, with the pleasantries, that leads probably seven to eight minutes to... There's no way in that period of time you're going to be do, doing anything other than, you know, prescribing a drug based on the symptoms that right. the patient has. And that's what our healthcare system is. So you, you go into the doctor, you've got high blood pressure. What's going to happen? Yeah, you're going to get blood pressure medication. Yeah. You, you go in with high right cholesterol. Away. What's going to happen? Yeah, cholesterol, cholesterol pills. And yeah. you say, doctor, how long am I going to take these medications? What are they going to, what's the answer? <laughs> Forever. Right. <laughs> that's, that's it in a nutshell. Mm. And, you know, don't get me wrong. The conventional medicine is amazing for acute emergency trauma situations. Like, you know, we were talking before I came. Like, if I get hit by a bus, Take me in the hospital right away. You, yeah, know? you don't want acupuncture. No, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want hypnotize me. I don't, I don't yeah. want functional medicine either yeah. in that situation. I want to go to the hospital, and you know, likewise, like we're being, we can restore sight to the blind now, or we can reattach limbs. I mean, it's amazing stuff, and and things like modern sanitation and antibiotics, and these things have incredible had incredible impacts on our quality of life and our lifespan. So I'm not denigrating that at all. But when it comes to chronic disease, which is by far the biggest challenge we face today, seven out of 10 deaths that happen are caused by chronic diseases, hmm. not accidents and trauma and emergency. So functional medicine takes a different approach. We look at it and we say, okay, like I said before, you've got all these different chronic diseases, but what are the common mechanisms or pathologies that are leading to all of these symptoms? And so those are, could think, be things like disrupted gut microbiome, which we've been talking about, or leaky gut. It could be things like blood sugar dysregulate, you know, high blood sugar, low blood sugar. They could be things like heavy metal toxicity. They could be things like 
uh, stress, which you know some people call adrenal fatigue. We can talk more about that. Yeah, Ooh. let's let's get into that it's because hot topic, huh? you were the first person because adrenal fatigue was this buzzword for a while in the yeah. wellness world. Well, it still is, and it still is. And I remember when, and I know maybe we can get into the symptoms of what that is, but I remember learning about the symptoms and seeing it in my clients and working with them uh, on that type of a model and helping them. But then I would have clients that were doctors and they'd say, what do you mean adrenal fatigue? If they got their hormones levels checked, their adrenals are functioning just fine. And then I read an article by you where you were saying adrenal, that's the wrong thing to call it. And you were calling it, uh, you were talking about HPA axis dysfunction. So first off, can we talk about what are the, the symptoms of, a, of what we used to call adrenal fatigue and why is adrenal fatigue the wrong thing to call it? Yeah, I mean, so this is this is epidemic today, and almost everybody I know has some level of it because oh. we're just burning the candle at both mm-hmm. ends, you know, mm-hmm. and we, we can't get away with that without consequences. So um, Wow, that's a strong statement. So you believe that, like, most of us are somewhat battling this? Yeah, yeah I mean, how many, how, uh, I don't know, what do you think? I agree, uh, we all agree yeah, with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, almost everyone I know Especially here in the has Silicon Valley. some issue. Okay, so here are the, the, the symptoms would be... Uh, you know, fatigue uh, could be waking up in the morning feeling unrefreshed, not getting you know quality restorative sleep, uh, difficulty with exercise tolerance or recovery. So you know your improvement and your, your progress in the gym is is starting to go back in the other direction. Um, could be uh, you know low low energy, uh, depression or anxiety. Um, the libido issue, low libido, yeah. cold hands and feet. For women, it's often amener, you know, com- lack of menstrual cycle completely or changes in their menstrual cycle. I'm sure you guys have seen this a lot. Women who t- who train who are training really intensely, they lose their not period. eating enough, they lose their periods. It's well known in the in the training world. Um, you know, there are, there are many more, but that's the basic constellation. And yeah, I mean, I, so many people that I work with and just friends, family, people I know in my life are dealing with it at some level, you know, it might not be severe, but it's, they're dealing with it in some way. And look, I mean, adrenal fatigue is, is an okay term, I think, for the general public to use. It's, it's, it's certainly easier to remember and say than HPA axis dysfunction. Okay. Um, And my point about this was, was mostly for practitioners and mostly around like, look, if we want to um, build bridges with conventional practitioners and, you know, be taken seriously, we have to use terminology that is consistent with what we understand about the body today. Mm -hmm. And so adrenal fatigue, the, the sort of core idea was that what happens is over time when we, when we burn the candle at both ends, these glands that sit on top of our kidneys, the adrenal glands get exhausted. They get tired and they can't produce cortisol. Cortisol is one of the main stress hormones. And so over time, the adrenals get tired, they can't produce cortisol, and that causes adrenal fatigue. And you know, again, in, in terms of people just trying to get a handle on this and, and figuring out how stress is contributing to their health problems, I think that's fine to talk about it that way. But the problem with it is that that's actually completely not what, <laughs> what happens oh, for wow, most people. Well, because then people yeah. go get tested and they're like, well, your cortisol levels are normal. Yeah. I guess I don't have adrenal fatigue. Well, we talked about leaky gut being the, the, the main way to generate eye rolling amongst doctors. But now I would say adrenal <laughs> fatigue has, yeah, has taken two, that huh? top spot. Candida might be number number three, yeah. so we can mm. talk about that. But right. um, So, yeah, I mean – it's true that stress has a big impact on this system called the, the HPA axis, hypothalamus in our brain, pituitary, uh, and then the, the adrenal glands. And this is a system that primarily governs our, our tolerance of stress and how we're impacted by it. The adrenals are just one part of that whole system. Most of it is actually in the brain. Um, so it's the brain that mostly determines that how, how you know, our stress response. And the adrenal glands, in some cases, will be unable to produce cortisol, but that's actually pretty rare. I mean, there's an autoimmune disease called Addison's disease, um, w- which leads to inability to produce cortisol. But in many cases, when we end up testing patients who have so-called adrenal fatigue, we see that they actually have high cortisol 
or maybe they're producing cortisol at the wrong, you know, not in the right amount at the right time of day. So it's it's just that it, it's, it's like low in the morning when it's supposed to be high. Exactly, and, and high at night when it's supposed to be low, and so that interferes with their sleep. They don't actually have a problem with production. They have a problem with regulation. Uh, hmm. And the reason I think this is important to understand is that, uh, well, for one, a lot of times people will go out and take supplements that raise their cortisol, which is obviously not a good idea if if their cortisol is high to begin with. Well, see, the problem is is that when you're when you're in this state of HPA axis dysfunction or adrenal fatigue or whatever you want to call it, you feel tired and fatigued and it feels good to take things right. that raise cortisol, like caffeine right. or stimulants or whatever. I was going to say, yeah, so does drinking coffee. It doesn't mean it's the best long-term solution. Mm-hmm. You know, you get a temporary hit, but then that can further uh, exacerbate this, this syndrome. Um, the other thing that's important to understand, I, I think, and I like the shift to H, HPA axis dysfunction. Maybe you guys can help me figure out a cooler name. I yeah, mean, I was, was going to say, like, we can rebrand H, that somehow. HPAD, 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 <laughs> HPAD. Uh, yeah, we need a rebranding well, effort. Well, yeah. why, can't, why can't it be more, re, uh, explain to me why it can't be just like cortisol regulation or the failure of that or the, why Because can't, there's other hormones and things yeah, involved. I mean, that is actually true. When I teach practitioners, I say you, sh- you, you can name the specific dysfunction. So you do testing and you find if they have high, high cortisol, you just call it high cortisol <laughs> or you can call it hypercortisolism, which is the mm. fancier, you know, scientific term. If it really is low cortisol, you can call it low cortisol, but you should find out right. testing mm-hmm. first. Or you can find you can call it, um, you know, cortisol dysregulation or disrupted right. cortisol rhythm when the because it's a diurnal hormone. It should be produced at high amounts in the morning and then drop during the day. Um, but the, the other point is that it's – if you just look at it as a cortisol problem, and this I think is what you were getting at, you're missing the bigger picture. And that's what I would often see with clinicians. It would be like, oh, adrenal fatigue. Okay, take these adaptogenic herbs and, you know, boost your, take some adrenal glandulars and you're done. You know, you're, you're, but if we understand that it's a system that, uh, you know, a whole disorder that involves the brain and other parts of the body, then we look at it in a bigger picture s- mm. setting. We, we know that there are four main triggers of this, of dysfunction. One, o- only one of them is perceived stress, which we, we all, that's what we think of when we think of stress, work stress, financial stress, relationship stress, et cetera. Another trigger is blood sugar issues. So, um, well, let me just name all of them. The third trigger is inflammation. And the fourth trigger is circadian disruption. So getting exposed to too much artificial light at night, the wrong time, not enough during the day, sitting in a room like this all day, <laughs> recording podcasts, not getting out in the sun, for example. This explains why you're uh, so man. fucked up, Justin. <laughs> <Yeah>. I know. <laughs> so, I don't know what was wrong with me. So let, I, this is an example I like to use with my patients. Let's say some someone's uh, you know, independently wealthy, laying on a beach in Thailand. So they've got no you know, perceived stressors as we would typically think of them, but they've got uh, SIBO, you know, intestinal bacterial overgrowth and inflammation in their body. Let's say they're eating a crappy diet and their blood sugar is high. And let's say they're staying up with their iPad in bed late at night, staring at the screen. That person could have a seriously disrupted HPA axis, even though they don't have any stress as we Mm. classically Mm. call it. And the treatment for that person would not be to give them yeah, adaptogenic herbs, herbs, yeah. herbs and some yeah, li- you know, li- 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 liver pills or whatever. <laughs> it oh, would man, be I have to address my lifestyle. It would be to, to fix the blood sugar, you know, fix the inflammation and help help them with circadian entrainment. You know, go outside. Well, he's on the beach in Thailand, so maybe this isn't the yeah. best example. Get off your iPad at night. <laughs> yeah, right? get off your iPad at night and make sure to go outside in the morning, get some bright light hitting your eyeballs. And, you know, so we, we, we expand it a lot more and we think about more things when we put it in this bigger context. Hmm. I, I think the other thing uh, that I read about was how, because it's now well accepted and understood that we can have something like uh, insulin resistance, where because we're constantly exposed to high levels of insulin, that our body then just becomes more and more resistant to it. And in this case, you could test someone for their insulin and be like, you have normal insulin levels, even though they display all the signs of low insulin because they're resistant to it. 
does this happen with hormone with other hormones? It happens with cortisol. This is actually one of the mechanisms I, I teach people and practitioners in my training course is cortisol resistance. So when you have high levels of cortisol, the body's going to do what it can to protect itself from excess cortisol. And one of the mechanisms for that is making the cells resistant to it or decreasing the number of receptors on the cell that you know for cortisol. So, so either way, you get a decrease in the effects of cortisol, even though the circulating cortisol levels are still high. So you can get a kind of paradoxical situation where you have the effects of low cortisol with circulate higher circulating cortisol levels. In that case, mm. in, the, in a situation like that, how do you uh, resensitize their body to cortisol? Well, the primary trigger for for cortisol resistance is inflammation. Mm. So, so lower so inflammation. You would reduce inflammation. Which yeah. is likely coming from the gut. Mm. All the stuff we've been talking yeah. about come from poor diet, poor sleep, uh, overtraining or undertraining, um, you know, uh, st- stress, uh, to- environmental toxins, which are unfortunately a growing problem that there's not very much awareness of. Wow. Mm. Do, would, could you, do you, would you say that a body that's in balance with all of these things should be largely void of any chronic health issue is that the root like kind of yeah. message yeah actually i know people have a really hard time believing this because now chronic disease is, is so common we think it's normal we think it's part of life yeah. yeah i always there's a big difference between what's common and normal and uh you know we everyone knows someone with chronic disease or maybe has one one in two americans now have a chronic disease and one in four have multiple chronic diseases now over 25% of kids have chronic disease, and that's up from just 13% in 1994. So we're not talking about a long, you know, that's 25 years and a a doubling of of the incidence of chronic disease in kids. So, you know, it's easy for us to be like, oh, chronic disease is just normal. Everybody has it. But actually, that's not true. And if you look in hunter-gatherer, contemporary hunter-gatherer cultures, they don't have chronic diseases typically. I mean, they suffer from, they have a lower lifespan on average, but those averages don't take into consideration the lack of emergency medical care and the high rates of infant mortality and deaths from trauma and warfare and getting eaten by a lion. Exposure to the elements, exactly. (laughs) And the anthropologists who have studied this have found that if that's considered and if people in those cultures survive those threats and if they have access to even the most rudimentary forms of medical care like walking for half a day to get to a rural medical clinic they live lifespans equivalent to our own in the west but the difference is they reach the ages that we reach without acquiring multiple chronic diseases they don't have heart disease they don't have diabetes they don't have obesity they don't typically get alzheimer's or dementia um you know, they, they actually just live long, healthy lives and typically die in their sleep. Mm. I had my own uh, experience where my body seemed to just rebel on me when I was 30. And this was after, you know, years, you know, I, I probably 15 years of abusing my body with supplements and mm. diet and, you know, overtraining because I was always into, you know, trying to build more muscle or whatever. And <clears throat> what happened to me was my all of a sudden I just had, I, I thought I had se- like severe irritable, irritable bowel or even worse. I couldn't, you know, I was losing weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seemed like everything affected me. And um, I did some food intolerance testing. And this, at this time, this is when I first really got introduced to the topic of, of leaky gut syndrome. And the person who did my test said, what you're probably going to find is that a lot of the foods that we're going to find that you're intolerant to are a lot of the foods that you eat a lot of now. And uh, it didn't make sense to me then because I remember thinking like, what are you talking about? I've always eaten these foods. These are things that I never had an issue with before. Why would I have an issue with them now? And the way they explained it to me was because of the inflammatory response that I had caused through, you know, my lifestyle and because my gut was, you know, permeable when it shouldn't, it started recognizing these foods that I ate all the time as uh, foreign invaders and it created antibodies. And, in, and this, is what ha- this is literally what happened. Like I, would, all, I couldn't eat peanuts. Up until this point, I ate peanuts every single day. Gluten was definitely an issue. Uh, dairy was an issue, but before that, it was lactose. So I knew I couldn't have lactose, but if something was lactose-free, I was fine. Well, now it was all milk proteins. 
I had developed antibodies against milk proteins, egg whites, because I ate lots of egg whites. And it was just went down the list of all these foods that I ate. Oh, spinach. Spinach was my vegetable. That's what I ate. Every time I had to have a vegetable, I'd have spinach. <laughs> and I developed an intolerance to spinach. Now, through the years, after identifying those things, changing my lifestyle and having to, you know, gradually really learn my lesson a few more times, I feel like I can have some of those foods again without having such a strong reaction. Uh, so my question to you is, can you, once, can you reverse some of these things? Yeah. Is that what I'm experiencing? What is the protocol for that? Yeah, so um, you made a couple of good points there that I want to highlight. One is, um, you know, and, and this sometimes happens where I'll get a patient come in and, and we'll do the testing. I'll say, you're gluten intolerant. They'll be like, what are you talking about? I eat, you know, bread and pizza all the time. I don't <laughs> yeah. have a problem with it. <laughs> That's you <know>? your problem. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there's this phenomenon that we call masking. And, and you know, right. it's a more scientific term, but I like to call it the dirty windshield effect because um, it's easier to understand. So imagine you have a dirty windshield and you get another speck of dirt on the windshield. You're not really going to notice that additional speck of dirt, right? And that's like what's happening when someone's eating gluten on a daily basis. So when they eat, they, they feel crappy, which is why they come to see me in the first place, but they don't notice like a significant effect right, right after eating the gluten. So you clean really that windshield. To them. Right. You clean the windshield. So you go, they go on and put them on a gluten-free diet for 60 days. Hmm. Then they're like, ah, oh, I, I think this is probably phony. And then they, you know, they, go they miss bread. it. They yeah. go have bread and then they're just like sprinting to the bathroom and yeah. just shoot, huge explosion. And then they come to me and they, they say, you caused me to have gluten intolerance. You gave me gluten intolerance. You know? <laughs> and I have to explain the, the dirty windshield analogy because I think the, the body in its wisdom has mechanisms for protecting us against right toxic it's trying to exposure. save you it's exactly. going to adapt you keep shoveling that shit in your mouth it's, it's going to eventually it's going to do what it can right. right and which you know is limited but it does, it's something but then you take those out and it's like the kind of like the proverbial sigh of relief the body lets down its defenses and then mm. you put it, you know and then you put it back in it's like whoa you really you know? feel the impact yeah. yeah so that's an important phenomenon to to point out so uh, often people will actually become more sensitive right away for that reason. I did initially because yeah. this has been years now. I'm 38, yeah. so this is eight years now of me doing this. It, initially, I would just have like a breadcrumb, you right. know, or whatever, and I'd have an issue. Right. Now I can eight years later. Now I can eat a bowl of pasta, and I don't do it very often because if I push it, then I'll have problems. But if I do once or twice, I notice a little bit, but I seem to be okay. So it's almost yeah. like I. I healed myself yeah is that? so okay. what, yeah i mean what happens there is the inflammatory response subsides the uh antibody production if there was if it was mediated by that tr declines to zero uh or drops so low that you know uh, there there's some controversy in this in the world of immunology but typically you know once you start producing the antibodies to something the idea is you have these memory cells that will remem remember, and that, that serves us very well. If we get exposed to a virus, like you know, chicken pox when we're young, then we get exposed to that later, even 20 or 30 years later, you have those mem the, me the cellular memory for, th for those antibodies, you can produce it and you won't get that virus again, right? You, or you're, not a, you're not affected by it. So um, with foods, it's less clear how that's actually happening. But I know from treating a lot of patients that generally after a period of time of avoiding the problematic foods and after the gut barrier heals, which that's probably what happened mm. in your case. Is that just the, is that the reproduction of good, healthy bacteria that's happened? Re reproduction of healthy bacteria, the sealing of the gut barrier so that it's not permeable and it's not letting these big food proteins in into the bloodstream it's a anymore. thin barrier yeah it's not a very thick so it's barrier. almost like you've yeah. got like this scab and you've stopped rubbing the scab and you let it fully heal again exactly and when we're constantly yeah. you know eating this this food that we have a to intolerance to it's like you're sitting there scratching at a scab which finally just let it be for a little while and then it that's heals right it. Mm -hmm. exactly and in that situation i mean those food proteins shouldn't be going into the bloodstream anyways that you were eating the only reason they were getting in is because you had a leaky gut that allowed those to get in and that's what triggers the immune response but if your gut barrier is sealed you know and and you should be much better at or able to tolerate it like like you you are and uh but you know as you said if you push it too much you start to go back in the other direction hmm.
Mm. Speaking of gluten, what is it with gluten? Why is that a common uh, intolerance? Why is it such a hot button? And if somebody's perfectly healthy, no inflammation, Why whatever. Why do so many hippies have it? Is, yeah, is, gluten, <laughs> is gluten a problem for everybody? Or just JJ Spears. He's hilarious. Is gluten a problem for everybody or just some people? Uh, so I, I might differ a little bit from, from my colleagues in this. I don't think there's strong evidence that gluten is a problem for everybody. You know, I, the, 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 the most kind of liberal estimates I've seen for non-celiac gluten intolerance, which means people who are affected by gluten but don't actually have celiac disease, are 1 in 10. So that would still mean that 9 in 10 people could theoretically eat gluten without having an immune-mediated response. Now, does that mean that I think gluten should be part of everybody's healthy diet? No, because think about most of the foods that have gluten in them. There are usually a lot of other reasons not to eat those foods. They're generally nutrient poor, you know, pretty processed and refined like breads or cookies or crackers or things like that. Uh, and they're, you know, they're generally not, uh, you know, when we think about diet, I think about it in terms of nutrient density. You want to maximize the nutrient density of every bite of food you put in your mouth because that's what our bodies run on. So if you're eating a lot of foods that are really depleted in nutrients, that's not going to be good for you no matter if you tolerate gluten or not. Mm. Um, the other reason I think it's tricky is that all of, you know, all of us are kind of just, um, unfortunately, uh, it's a constant battle to stay healthy in this world. I mean, there's so many threats, whether we're talking about diet or lifestyle or environmental toxins, et cetera, that who knows who's going to become one of those one in 10 people that mm -hmm. starts reacting to gluten. And I think it's, you know, probably... If you're concerned about that and you want to maximize your chances of staying healthy, it's probably safer. Just I feel, I feel like it's like it. getting punched in the head. It's like some people get knocked out right away when you get punched in the head. <laughs> and and just because you didn't get knocked out doesn't mean it's probably a good idea to keep getting punched in the head. Isn't it kind of like yeah. that? It could be like that. I mean, it, I, I, I think of, I like there's, I think, or I think of things of like in a spectrum, you know, like it, it's just. Uh, there are a lot of people out there, if they're eating a little bit of gluten in the context of a diet that's overall healthy and nutrient dense, and they're taking care of their sleep, you know, they're getting the right amount of exercise, the right amount of sun exposure, they're doing everything right, that person's probably going to be mm -hmm. fine. But then you take someone who is eating processed and refined foods and gluten, they've got a disrupted gut microbiome, they have intestinal permeability, they're not sleeping well, they're, you know, all of those kinds of things, which really is the majority. a lot, yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot the majority. of people in our, in our culture, then I think the risks start to get high that something's going to go wrong. I think, I think it's also, uh, we also have to consider that in Western societies, gluten is just an everything. And if mm -hmm. you, and, and what I mean by that is if you go to like, for example, what country in the world do you think has some of the highest rates of rice intolerance, right? Countries that eat a lot of rice. Yeah. Like you go to Japan and, and having an intolerance to rice is much higher than you would find in other countries. Just because of the consider. chronic exposure. I think we're just inflamed and gluten is in fucking everything. It's mm, not only yeah. in food that contains flour, but it's added to foods that don't for, you know, it's for the texture or it's mm -hmm. mouthfeel or whatever. They add gluten to sports drinks sometimes to make them taste a particular way or, or marinades or, and I found this all out yeah, the hard marinades. way when I was dealing with my gut issues is where I let, I said, you know, they told me don't eat gluten. So I said, no problem. And I was buying these marinated chicken breasts and I was eating them and I was having horrible reactions. And finally someone said, dude, there's, there's gluten in the, in your wow, marinade. That's fascinating. I didn't know that. It's in everything. And so yeah. this is why the common food, look at, look at the common intolerances that, that the most common ones, right? Dairy, you know, nuts, uh, egg whites, you know, gluten. I mean, these are things that we just consume a lot of. And, and if you understand that when you get inflamed, when you, if these things, you know, pass through the gut barrier, your body creates antibodies against them. Gluten's probably going to be one of them because it's just, an, it's literally in almost just everything. Keep bombarding it. Yeah, like there's a deamidated gliadin, which is a food additive, uh, can often be put in things without having the, the manufacturer actually having to say that there's gluten in it too. Mm. So it's really tricky for patients who are super sensitive like you were at one point because you don't, you know, it's, I mean, I just tell those patients, just don't buy processed or refined foods because you never really know, mm -hmm. you know, and if they have a reaction that is clear, that's one way to know. 
But the the bigger problem is what about people who have uh, a reaction that's not so viscerally clear? That's so, great. Let's go into that. Yeah. So there's there's something called let's just stick with celiac for for the time being. But um, there's something called silent or atypical celiac disease, and most people when they think of celiac, they think of gut problems, you know, diarrhea, gas, bloating, uh, et cetera, because that's the typical presentation of celiac. But there are a lot of people who have celiac that don't have that. And they, the way it might manifest for them is in the brain. So there might be a, ta- a gluten-related ataxia is a form of paralysis that's caused by gluten. So this is how serious it, that it can be. It t- typically happens in children, but it can happen in adults too. Gluten and, and celiac has been linked to all kinds of uh, brain-related disorders like depression, even schizophrenia, anxiety, to neurological problems like multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's and, and other issues. Uh, it can also manifest in the skin. Atopic dermatitis or eczema is one of the most common what they call extra intestinal, meaning outside of the gut manifestations of celiac disease. But all of this skin conditions, psoriasis, uh, you know, acne, acne rosacea can all be related to gluten intolerance. So this is problematic because a patient, you know, imagine somebody who is having, you know, has uh, neurological issues and anxiety. That's the last thing they're going to test. They're they're not going to think about that. They go to the the special doctor for that. You know, we have different doctors for all the different parts of the body. (laughs) Then they go to the dermatologist. Yeah. they, yeah, Yeah. They go to that doctor and that doctor puts them on some, you know, medication for those symptoms. Then they go to the dermatologist and they say, I've got this skin rash, this dermatitis. Doctor gives them some cream, you know, steroid cream for that. And then, you know, they maybe go to their primary care doctor for nobody's putting the pieces together and and draw and and realizing that all of these symptoms in this patient are related to one single food protein yeah. <laughs> that if they remove from their diet can resolve all of these problems so that again like getting back to functional medicine that's the difference between functional medicine and conventional medicine the conventional medicine is often playing whack-a-mole <laughs> with <laughs> symptoms you know and functional medicine we're asking the question what is at the root of this problem hmm. Hmm. That's a that's a huge uh, that's a huge paradigm shift. Uh, yeah. Although I am, I think I have hope because I feel like we're heading in that direction. I just think we're, yeah. we're probably another couple decades away from it. But well, I don't it know. Chris like, deals with it on a regular basis. What do uh, you think? I mean, how much are you fighting Western medicine every how day? How many things do you need to rebrand? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm gonna need your help for sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's both. You know, I think there's both uh, really promising signs that. I mean, ultimately, I think functional medicine is just how medicine will be practiced in the future. I don't think that at some point it will even be a separate thing. Mm -hmm. It's just going to, at some point, we're going to realize this is the way we have to approach chronic disease. Like the, if you think about how our medical model evolved, it's, it's, it's easy to understand how we got to where we are. So in the year 1900, the top three causes of death were typhoid, tuberculosis, and pneumonia. So all acute infectious diseases, right? The main reasons other people went to the doctor at that point were also acute. They were like a gallbladder attack or appendicitis or broken bone. So they would see one doctor, they would get one treatment. You know, it might be the doctor removing the appendix or the gallbladder or setting the bone or might be later after antibiotics were developed, there would be an antibiotic for the infection. And that was it. Very straightforward, right? And our medical model, frankly, excels at that. It, mm-hmm. it, it, it excelled at that then, and it excels at it now. It's just getting better and better at that kind of intervention. But chronic diseases are not at all straightforward in that way. So the average person now, you know, has mo- one or more chronic diseases. They require multiple doctors. They, you know, they're seeing a doctor for every different part. They might be taking multiple medications and they might be taking these treatments for the rest of their life. So we have a medical model that evolved in the context where acute problems were the biggest issue and has been kind of applied to this to our current Mm-hmm. challenge, which is chronic disease. There, there's, by far, it's the biggest challenge. 
and it doesn't work. It's using the wrong, you know, it's like using a hammer to screw, to, to, to screw in a screw. It's just not, I mean, it kind of works, you know, you just <laughs> keep banging that thing and it'll get in there, but it, you know, it's not the right tool for the job. Yeah. And it, it needs to evolve because we are solving a lot of those problems, but now the chronic and the main killers, I just read a, a study, uh, you know, Heart disease is still number one. Cancer's catching up to it. Can- cancer, cancer is starting to kill. It's very close. And actually, you know what is number three? Little known fact here. Uh, is this, Me- uh, medical mess ups. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was number one. Medical yeah. care. Yeah. Not even mess ups. No. Er- just- errors are one part of a subset of it. Oh, okay. But mm. even like, for I knew example, it was up there. Yeah. <laughs> medication that's prescribed crazy. appropriately. You know, <laughs> that's crazy. It, it, it's oh, not man. like the wrong medicine, like the doctor made the, you know, dosing error or something. It's the right medicine, but it just happens to have death as a side effect. <laughs> you know? yeah, just, a, just a little bit. Um, yeah. So there's a, a editorial published in the in BMJ, British Medical Journal in 2016, that, that counted up the, the deaths from what they call iatrogenic events. So these are events caused by medical intervention of some type. They could be errors, but they might also just be the right thing done with unfortunate outcome. Wow. Uh, and there was another analysis in 2000 that, that found the same thing. And that analysis actually, and this might be what you were thinking of, they said that only 5 to 20% of iatrogenic events are actually reported. Hmm. So that if all were reported, it would actually be the number one more. cause of death. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Our, yeah. our medicine is killing us. So, yeah. uh, I mean, one of the best examples of this is Alzheimer's disease. Mm. So now, you know, it's growing on the list of top causes to death. It's it's making a run for, for number one. And I mean, I don't know about you guys, but that's terrifying. Like oh, uh, yeah. if, if you think of like the worst way to die, I think, Losing you know, your I'd rather get eaten by a shark for mm-hmm. sure. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a surfer and I'm like, yeah, send me out there. You know, when it's time for me to go. Gary the Great White, <laughs> just <laughs> go go an epic. I would uh, rather, yeah, I would, I would rather go out that way than get yeah. Alzheimer's disease, and and it's just devastating for not just the person oh, who has it, but you. the family members. I mean, they, we talked about HPA axis dysfunction before. When 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 researchers want to study that, guess who they study? Caregivers of people with Alzheimer's, because mm. it's recognized that they're like the people that are under the greatest most stress. stressful thing you could do. Yeah. So if, so, every, if everybody, oh, go ahead, Chris, sorry. I was just going to say, 25 years of drug development for Alzheimer's, using this conventional medicine approach of like the silver bullet. What's the one thing, the one drug that we can develop that will, you know, mm-hmm. reverse this syndrome? And that, because that's the conventional approach is is symptom suppression. Like, we'll figure out a mechanism, we'll, 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 we'll develop a drug to target it, and then that's how we'll do it. Complete failure. After 25 years, not a single drug can re- can uh, prevent the progression of Alzheimer's, much less reverse it. Mm. And, you know, there are researchers now, I talk about one in my book, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who's been studying Alzheimer's his whole life as a bench scientist. He's an MD, scientist, but he's mostly, he was in a lab trying to find this silver bullet. And he eventually figured out that that's not going to work. Why? Because Alzheimer's, like every other chronic disease, is not caused by a deficiency of a drug, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that hasn't been developed yet. It's like heart disease is not caused by statin deficiency, right? It's caused by all of these numerous factors we've been talking about in our modern diet and lifestyle that can tr- cause inflammation and all the other mechanisms that lead to Alzheimer's. And so what he argues is we need, we don't need a silver bullet, we need silver buckshot. Mm. which is a, you know, a good analogy. We need a, mm. a multi-pronged approach to addressing chronic disease that looks at the patient's diet, looks at their lifestyle, looks at their behavior, and then starts looking at underlying mechanisms or pathologies that lead to all of these different syndromes and diseases and symptoms. Mm-hmm. And that's how chronic disease has to be approached. So I really do believe that eventually that's just how we will approach chronic disease. We won't call it functional medicine. It will just be how we approach chronic disease. And I think we'll get there either the hard way or the easy way. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I'm knowing our history, I'm, probably the hard way. Yeah. I, I tend to <laughs> yeah. believe that, to be honest. Um, I will get there by just literally beating our heads into the wall, you know, one f- too many times where we finally realize that the approach that we're doing isn't working and that it's bankrupting 
our government. I mean, that some statistics I've seen suggest will be completely insolvent by the year 2035 mm -hmm. because of rising healthcare expenditures. And you know, I'm glad you brought up Alzheimer's because it wasn't that long ago that Alzheimer's was considered a psychiatric uh, disorder. Right. But now we consider it a physical disease because we can see that what's actually happening to the brain. But the reason why I'm making this 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 point is because we separate we tend to separate mental disorders from physical as if they're not connected. And the reason why I'm talking about this is we have just recently we had a tragedy in in uh, Las Vegas. We had someone just a, a lunatic just just kill all these people. And I was thinking about it this weekend and how you know there's a distinct difference between people who do something like that and your everyday crime where it's either because of poverty because they're they're, they're stealing something or gang related or the black war you know the, the black market uh, for drugs mm -hmm. here you have someone actually losing their mind so i went through and i actually did some research and i i knew what i'd find but i wanted to see it my for myself and we all know and it's it's widely accepted now the uh, the, the 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 physical what's happening to our physical health and how bad it is and how bad it's getting you know people call it the obesity epidemic or the diabetes ed epidemic or just the chronic health epidemic but people were, are not talking about the mental health epidemic that is also Connected right along it. right along with it mm. right along yeah. with it you have as our physical health is declining so is our mental health to the point now where uh, I forget, but there's a, an incredible statistic in terms of the, the amount of people that are prescribed um, antipsychotics, antidepressants, ADHD yeah. medications, anti uh, you know uh, anxiety, anxiety medications, mm -hmm. all through the roof, and they're all connected. Can we talk about that for a second? The 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 how the connection between our physical health and our mental health. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I mean, it's true. The World Health Organization, I think, uh, saw some recent statistics that depression's increasing by twenty percent year over year. Holy wow. shit! Twenty every year. Wow, yeah. that's a lot. And that it's it's you know predicted to become one of the most uh, biggest health health problems from mm -hmm. a global perspective, not just in the developed world, but in the developing world as well. Um, and I mean, depression and and other mental health. Um, issues are really complex topics. So I don't, I don't want to be too reductionistic here because it's it's true. Uh, certainly our circumstances affect our mental health. There's no doubt about that. I think that's been firmly established. Uh, and depression can often be situational and related to those circumstances. We know that, so I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, what I want to introduce here is something that's less well known, which is that, let's just take depression. Um, you know, for, for many years, the prevailing thinking was, well, initially it was that depression was caused by serotonin deficiency. Mm. That was never really believed by serious scientists. Um, that was a made up thing that made it easier to sell antidepressants. Yeah, because I think they discovered th that these drugs, uh, you know, increase circulating levels of serotonin. And so then they, they had to came up backwards. with theory afterwards, exactly. which is how they, with statins yeah. and all the other drugs are like and, that. And they, you know, drug companies hire marketing you know, advertising agencies who yeah. then first before the scientists with, yeah, yeah. They they get the marketing this. first, That's then right. we go get our scientists. And, uh, you know, advertising <laughs> agencies have come up with all kinds of new names for diseases. They create the disease to d create the demand for the drug. That's fucking, how we got Viagra. Yeah. Unreal, That's how man. we got Viagra. Viagra absolutely. Uh, they, they, created a a, they created a drug to erectile ED. Yeah. Erectile it, was, ED. it was for heart. It was for blood pressure yeah. and it kind of worked for blood pressure, but oh shit, people are getting boners. More boners comes in. ED. Same in a lot. Yeah. Uh, m uh, yeah, yeah. Same thing with the stuff you put on your, what is it called, minoxidil. Yeah. Or yeah. A, a lot of these were just Broding. marketing teams that came mm -hmm. in and SSRIs. Like, yeah. we have this drug that does this. What can we do yeah. with it? Yeah. So, so yeah. So Restless it was like, like, okay, serotonin deficiency. You've got low serotonin. That's very easy to communicate, you know, in advertisements. And people were walking around going, yeah, I've got low serotonin. I take this drug. It increases my serotonin. Great. So only problem is that was not <laughs> not accurate. And certainly depression can involve changes in brain chemistry, neurotransmitter levels and things like that. But still, the question is why, right? Is it just because of situational factors or are there some other things at play? Well, there's a more current theory of what causes depression in many cases, and it's called the technical term is the immune cytokine model of depression. But the, the <laughs> it's pretty easy to understand. It's inflammation that generally starts in the gut, and inflammation, these inflammatory cytokines, that's the, this, their chemical messengers, get 
created in, do, in, the, in the gut. They cross into the bloodstream. They go up to the brain, cross the blood-brain barrier, and they suppress the activity of the frontal cortex. And that produces the symptoms which we refer to as depression. Wow. Mm. So basically, in many cases, depression is a problem that starts in the gut and then affects the brain. And this has been, like, people have been writing about the gut-brain axis for 100 years. Mm -hmm. There were these uh, MD scientists at Duke University in the 1930s um, that uh, wrote a paper on the gut-brain-skin axis. And they actually talked about how changes in the gut can lead to skin problems, psoriasis, eczema, and also depression and anxiety. And they even talked about probiotics as a, a way of intervening to address these wow. problems. That was even before the term probiotics had been huh. invented, but they talked about a fermented milk beverage, which is basically, you know, probiotic mm. as a, a way for for intervening here. So this has been known for a hundred years, but it's only recently that that's been kind of rediscovered because I think the whole depression and mental health field got so hijacked by the pharmaceutical Feel mm. that we stopped actually thinking about well, what are some of the underlying causes that contribute to these problems. ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, there are now researchers um, in the U.S. and abroad who are looking at, okay, certainly we know that genetic predisposition is a big factor, but the, the st stratospheric rise in autism, the latest figures I think even from the CDC are now one in 45 kids wow. have autism. So it just, used to be like one in like yeah. 4,000. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and we're uncommon. talking about a short period of time. Yeah. There's no way that genes can explain that. It's impossible. Our mm -hmm. genes cannot change that quickly. Yeah, we've never evolved and so, changed that fast. No. Before. So there, there ha it has to be envir environmental, environmentally driven. And so there are researchers who are now looking at this. And there's a, a, ex a, a framework called the three hit paradigm. I'm not going to remember, I might not remember them exactly, but it's basically genetic predisposition, micro, uh, microbiome disruption, and then environmental insults that all, so you have, you know, poor diet, uh, environmental toxins, all these things, they affect the microbiome. Microbiome changes in such a way that it alters neurochemistry that then results in ADHD, OCD, autism spectrum anxiety and all these problems that are so epidemic now in and, kids. And I know there's got to be people right now that are going like, well, wait a second, how does that happen to a child who's born with autism? So that now, but I know we have studies that are linking what the mother, you know, the mother is passing down to yeah. the child. And it most certainly Absolutely. could be coming from some of the habits that she had for her entire life. And that's what's happening. Right? So we, we don't see, yeah, that's a really key point. We see, heritable traits as, as always being genetic, but that's not necessarily true. You inherit your initial imprint for your gut microbiome from your mom. You know, the, your first exp you know, the baby's microbiome or gut is relatively sterile. It used to be thought that they had no bacteria in their gut in utero, but now some recent research has suggested that actually bacteria can cross the placenta and they, mm. there may be some initial seeding that happens while the baby's still in the womb. But generally speaking, even with this new research, the primary kind of seeding of the microbiome, if you think about it as a garden analogy, the seeds are planted when the baby is coming, coming through the through birth the, canal, yeah, birth canal yeah. and gets exposed to the bacteria to the How? point where when a baby is born by C-section, hmm. there's actually movement now for doctors to swab the vaginal area yeah, of the mother and, 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 you know, and, and apply it to the baby to give it that exposure. This is not like woo-woo stuff. This yeah. is actually, you know, there are papers that have been written about this. So what that means is you can, it's not genetic that you're inherit, you know, but you're still inheriting that from your mother. And if the mother, we know that um, now the mothers of autism have been studied and they have, they have a lot of different characteristics. So it's a combination of these genetic and environmental factors. Hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. That's so uh, here's something I'm going to throw you a, a, kind of a, a curveball here. Um, I've been reading about, so I have a family member with Crohn's, mm -hmm. and so very close to them, and so I've done lots of my own reading and research on autoimmune disorders and diseases, and there's this fascinating kind of sect and field of study where people with autoimmune diseases will self-administer uh, a... Uh, like a parasite, um, yeah. and that'll cause their symptoms to many times disappear. 
Um, what's going on there? Do you know what's going on there? What's yeah. Going, okay. Yeah. Oh, I mean, as much as we know, what's going. I'm, I'm very familiar with the research, and I um, actually did that myself. Um, so I have some personal experience. Oh there. wow! Uh, I don't know if you guys know anything about my history, but I uh, I got into this work because I I got extremely sick with a digestive illness when I was uh, surfing in Indonesia in my early 20s, and I got exposed to multiple parasites it just totally wrecked my gut and at one point i was diagnosed with ibd crohn's disease uh, I, I don't think it was accurate now in retrospect but me being the the geek that i am i you know i wasn't gonna do the steroids and the typical treatment and and i was probably very early days in this hel- you're, you're referring to helminthic therapy yeah there you go so helminths are nematode typically nematodes they're worms and um, they've been a part of mammalian evolution for something like 300 million years so in other words all mammals harbor helminths they have worms and typically it's not a problem i mean we think of worms it's gross first of all and <laughs> we don't want to especially if you go and look Ew. up pictures of some of these organisms yeah, I on did. Google, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're gross. They're, uh, woo, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll turn you off to this idea real quick in most cases. But um, generally, uh, there's even a theory and then there's research behind this that suggests that our immune systems evolved in response to these organisms. Like this is so long ago in, in evolution that we're talking about pre-immune system as we wow. even understand the immune system. And there's some thinking that our immune system evolved in response to these organisms oh, wow. such that in a way, our immune system can't function properly right. without them. And so uh, what happens is in the industrialized world, we, we got sanitation. Hmm. And sanitation has saved, you know, immeasurable number of lives. Like it prevents so much acute infection. So I'm not saying we should go back to an unsanitized environment, but all of all things have consequences and some of them are anticipated and hoped for and others are unanticipated. And one of the unanticipated consequences of the increase in sanitation and the removal of is the removal of these organisms from our guts. And uh, one way I like to explain it to people is if you, if you, if you're standing up and you, you, you have your hands out and you're facing someone and you, and they have their hands out and you're leaning into them. If you apply a kind of a similar amount of weight, you're going to balance, you know, you're not going to, neither one's going to fall down. You're balancing each other out. And this is how our immune systems were tuned in the presence of these organisms. So these organisms exerted like a, a, a kind of tuning effect where our immune system would push back a little bit and they're pushing back a little bit. So we're in that state of dynamic balance. What happens if you take away those organisms and fall over? Yeah. The immune system, that energy that was being over. directed at that low level path, you know, pathogen that's there starts getting directed at something else. Yeah. What does it get directed at? Itself. Our own tissue. <laughs> oh, shit. Exactly. So, or environmental antigens like dust, pollen, bee stings, you know, the, it can show up as allergies. Mm. Like this, it's just a hyperactive, hypervigilant immune response because it doesn't have those, you know, those internal things that, that it, we had for so long. Mm. And this is, this is called the old friends hypothesis. Uh, it's sometimes called the hygiene hypothesis as well because the, of the you know hygiene and sanitation being related to it. But old friends refers to these worms, which were our old friends in the sense that they tuned and regulated our immune system. And so once you know this theory began to be developed, then the obvious question was, can we reintroduce these mm. organisms and will, will that have the same impact? And lots of research uh, and clinical experience suggests that they can in people with There's So what was your experience? Wow. What, ha- what right. happened with you? So I've done it twice. I, um, there's two ways that it's typically done. One is with uh, Trichura suisse, which is pig whipworm. So it's a whipworm, and it's one that typically colonizes pigs. And the reason that they, they, used, they, they first selected this is that it can't colonize humans long term which means that you know when you, you swallow the whip, whipworm, it will stay in you for about a week and it will have its immune regulating effects, but then you poop it out and it's gone. It can never you know, take up residence long-term. And so the thinking was that was safer to mm. do that. 
The problem was it doesn't have the same impact because it's not really a human mm. adapted organism. Mm -hmm. So then they also start using human hookworm, Necator americanus, and this can colonize the human host and it will stay in human. But, um, you know, hookworm can be problematic, but only with uncontrolled exposure. So like, let's say some, you know, uh, a person living in a rural village in Africa is walking barefoot in through latrine kind of area and they, they're continually getting more and more hookworms and they can start developing anemia and other problems with parasites. But if you have only a, a small population of hookworms, maybe 25 hookworms, then you can get the immune regulating benefits. They don't multiply and, and just you know grow inside of you. You just have that same 25. And they stay number. with you? Like they they don't, stay with yeah. you in theory. Hmm. Uh, if you take antibiotics or certainly antiparasitics like mebendazole, you can get rid of them. Um, so I did the Trichura Suisse first. Didn't really have much impact on me one way or another. And then a, uh, a little while later, I did the hookworm. It didn't really have much impact on me either, um, other than being kind of weirded out, <laughs> weirded <laughs> out by the whole thing <laughs> and uh, having to go to Tijuana to do it because there, it's not, this is not legal. Um, you know, and, and there are some legitimate you know, ways to do it in Tijuana. As you probably know, there's like some medical tourism that happens mm -hmm. there. They have, you know, good doctors and down there. I don't, you know, recommend this to people um, without being under the supervision of someone who really knows what they're doing. But in my case, it didn't work simply because I don't think I ever had Crohn's disease. Mm. And I had inflammation in the terminal ileum that was probably caused by the parasite infections that I had. And it was misdiagnosed as, as Crohn's disease. However, I've had lots of patients, not lots, I mean, this is a pretty out there mm -hmm. <laughs> therapy, but I can think of over 10 over the years that have done it. And in some cases, it's been absolutely miraculous. We're talking about people who were facing you know, removal of their colon uh, because their, their inflammatory bowel disease was so bad, who basically within you know, a three-month period became almost symptom-free. Wow. Without making any other changes, wow! Other than the, the hook what's the therapy. other one? So what's the other one, Sal? That everyone's leaving the country to go do the stem cell stuff. What's uh, I don't know. There's a, there's another there's another procedure right now. People are that you can't do in the states. That's are fecal you, transplant. Are you thinking a fecal transplant? I don't think it's fecal stuff. There's another one that we're not. What we don't do here. You know who did it was uh, Dan Bilzerian. He left. He goes to. Uh, he fought. Oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I think that's legal here in the states. Is it? Yeah. There it's is just stem injections. cell here in the states. It's not really that regulated at this point, and there's some a lot of controversy about what you can and should use it for. Hmm. Um, but but it is legal. It's you know it's about ten grand a pop. Yeah, maybe that's what <laughs> so, it is. What do you know about it? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't have a lot of expertise in stem cell treatment, but I know it's, you know, uh, there are some indications that it actually has been studied for in peer reviewed journals published, you know, uh, particularly related to musculoskeletal complaints, tissue regeneration and repair, et cetera. But it's being used in a much broader way by, in some clinics for just, you know, health optimization and life extension and yes that's, um, that's what i hear people yeah you know like looking younger <laughs> i yeah. mean uh I, I know a couple of people who've done it uh and actually do look you know five or ten years younger than they did before um but there's i think there's some unanswered questions still about hmm. that so your experience uh, with the parasites after you went surfing is that that's what got you to do what you're doing now is that or were you already yeah no i was not really contemplating a career in health healthcare. Um, I, I was uh, on a different track and I, but I got so sick and really, you know, when I came back, that was my first experience with the conventional healthcare system. I was a pretty healthy kid and teenager athlete, you know, you know, I'm maybe gone to the doctor a handful of times and just for the usual stuff. And when I came after that and I got sick, I, I, you know, went to the doctor and, and the doctor prescribed some antibiotics and said, oh, it's probably just parasites, you'll get better. And then, you know, it took about 10 years for me to fully recover my health. And uh, that was, it was a brutal journey. And along the way, I learned just how uh, poorly equipped the conventional medical system is for dealing with the kind of problems that I had that didn't fit into like a nice, clean, straightforward box. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and weren't amenable to just some drugs or medication. And so I, as I started to get better, people around me started to ask, what are you doing? Because they'd seen how sick I was. I mean, I was, I was taken to the curb. I was completely down and out, unable to work. Um, you know, I was in my mid twenties. I had no idea if I was even going to be able to like support myself and live a normal life. And so it was pretty scary. Um, and then people around me, as I started to get better, were like, wow, how, how, you know, how, how did this work? What did you do? And I started to share with them. And then just over time realized that that's, there was a lot that I had learned in that process that could be helpful to other people and, uh, decided to go back to school and formalize that. And then, you know, here I am. Well, that's excellent. Yeah, I'm glad that happened for you. Well, I'm, I'm sad that it happened for you. I'm always <laughs> sad that you're here. I'm glad you got, glad you got sick, man. We're sick yeah. for a decade, yeah. but yeah. It's, it's helped me out a you lot. You helped us <laughs> with, with, you with know, your sickness. Gifts, gifts come in many, many different ways. Yeah. You know course, what I mean? Of course. And that's no. the way you got to look at it. So uh, That's definitely the way I look at it. I mean, I wouldn't be here if that, you know, in this chair, if that weren't the case. What would mm. you say uh, is the, the, the single greatest, uh, I, I guess, uh, threat to our health in modern times right now? What would you say is the, the one thing that we could, if, if someone were to look at just one thing, what would you say that would be? Well, I would say chronic disease, but I think you're asking as a cause, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, diet is the kind of, it's still up there at the top, but there's more awareness about that. I would say actually sleep deprivation is probably, uh, when I look at the research, on just about every condition. And let's just talk about obesity. So most people think of obesity, they think of diet and exercise, right? As being the big triggers. And mm -hmm. certainly diet, I think still is the primary trigger. But exercise actually, although it's important, it's not, uh, sleep is probably number two mm -hmm. ahead of exercise in terms of the obesity epidemic. And um, this is, I, I think, not really even that controversial now in, this, in, the, in the scientific world, at least. They, they, their studies have shown that I think eight nights of sleep deprivation can lead to an increase in calorie intake of over 500 calories a day, Wow! which is equivalent to fit, gaining 52 pounds in a year. Wow. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's significant sleep deprivation that they're doing in an experimental setting. So it wouldn't be likely that someone would have that every night in their life. But mm -hmm. if you take just even a lower level of that, right. um, where someone is like, we now know that 35% of Americans sleep less than six hours a night. And that's up from just 2% in 1960. So mm -hmm. that's a 15 fold increase in the number of people that are getting less than six hours a night of sleep in just the past, you know, 60, 50 to 60 years. 15 years mm -hmm. ago, I, I would have laughed if someone talked about sleep and yeah, walking. Sleep to burn yeah. sleep. Fat. And they're yeah. the two things I talk to more than anything else yeah. now is yeah. addressing yeah. sleep and then just moving. Because yeah. I feel like those two are, are probably the simplest things that people can uh, address and look at in their life and yeah. start to make improvements. Yeah, we've that, totally had to change our tune with that, too. I like, bet. Yeah, because yeah, it's in it your was, profession. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I, if you look at this is where the ancestral perspective comes in. So it's so helpful. You know, we, we it's not that we need to return to the lifestyle of our ancestors, but we can use differences in our modern lifestyle with our historical lifestyle to generate hypotheses about what might be screwing us up, you know? Right. So we look at our ancestors, we say, oh, they, and contemporary hunter gatherers, most of them slept at least seven, eight hours a night. Like in the Tsimane people uh, in Bolivia who have been recently studied, we can talk more about that. It's really interesting. There's not even a word for insomnia in their, in their language. <laughs> they, 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 you know, the researchers were trying to ask them about insomnia, <laughs> but there was like, there's no word because, you know, they, they sleep and they sleep restfully um, and they sleep for seven to eight hours. And so then we can start asking like, okay, well, that's not happening now. And does that make a big difference? And then we can, with movement, we look at our ancestors and we say, and contemporary other gatherers, and we say, okay. They walked an average of 10, 12,000 steps a day. They didn't sit for long periods. And yeah, so those, those lower level activities were punctuated by more intense activity, yeah. like chasing prey or lifting something heavy when they're though. building something. Sporadically, uh -huh. exactly. So now we're in a situation where 
you could meet the government recommended uh, uh, guidelines for exercise. You can be completely sedentary, but go to the gym for three to five days a week and exercise for 30 minutes a day. You're meeting the government guidelines but for exercise. still considered a sedentary person. You're per- still at mm-hmm. a much higher risk of death and disease than if you mm-hmm. are gardening, walking or bicycling to work, you know, taking the stairs instead of the escalator and just doing what is called non-exercise physical activity. Neat. So, Neat. Yeah, so we, we make the case that it, when you look at the problems with modern lifestyle and what forms of exercise directly combat though some of these modern problems, one of the best forms of exercise is resistance training. And, and yeah. the, the reason why I say that is because resistance training directly improves how your body responds to cortisol, insulin, and it also has an adaptive effect in, uh, effect in the body where it causes you to your, your body wants to burn more calories, which isn't necessarily a good or bad thing, but in the context of modern lifestyle, it is because you want to be able to have a metabolism that burns more calories with modern lifestyle, which usually results in yeah. more calorie intake. Most people are in a caloric surplus, so it's not a bad thing yeah. to, to do that. And The other benefit of resistance training is just maintaining bone health as we age. You probably heard the phrase, break break your hip, die of pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Like fractures are a big deal in elderly population because they result in immobility and that immobility Mm -hmm. can cause pneumonia and other things that can kill you. So it's no joke to maintain healthy bones as you get old and resistance training is one of the best ways to do that. Absolutely. Chris, what, where did where did the motivation for all of this come? I know we talked about what happened in your 20s, but go all the way back to like high school. What kind of kid were you like in high school? Were you a nerd? Were you always reading and studying? I mean, uh, I, I was I did well in school, but I was, you know, I identified as an athlete. You know, I, I, play, I played basketball in high school. I was a surfer all my life, but I played basketball in high school and then was going to play in college. Uh, UC Davis and oh, San, or, or Santa Clara, actually, not too far from here. Mm-hmm. Uh, where, where I got recruited. And then at the last minute, I decided to, uh, I, I wouldn't have chosen either of those schools were it not for basketball. And I didn't really want to, want to go to either of those schools. So at the last minute, I decided to go to UC Berkeley, which I did, I was interested in. And uh, I was going to try to walk on there, but um uh, unfortunately, Jason Kidd. I was just going to say, I was just going to say, you were, no. you were, you so, I, okay, yeah, we I are was, around the same generation. Right. Yeah, I was a guard. I was a guard. So, yeah. Jay Kidd was playing my position. I was well, like, oh, well, well yeah. thanks, try thanks for trying. Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe guess, you'll get hurt. I guess I'll yeah. give up basketball now. And right. no, I did play like inter- intramurals, which was pretty competitive at Berkeley. But, I, you know, I just kind of left that behind. So, I've always been driven by athletics and performance. Um, did you watch him play a lot? Were you? Did, oh yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I'm a diehard Jason Kidd fan. Amazing. I played basketball awesome. all through high school. I actually played against him. I uh, there's a I don't know, there's a, a league called Slam and Jam. Yeah, yeah. You remember that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was on the Southern California All Stars, and he was on the Northern California All Stars. And my big claim to fame was that he only scored forty on me because <laughs> in high yeah, school that's... you scored like 80 oh, a dude, game. He, was he, he was like yeah. six four point guard who could like jump through the roof i mean that, in high school that that was just bizarre yeah. you know super um and then i i got really into martial arts when i was in high school i actually started with um, muay thai um, studied with Richard Bustillo and Dan Inosanto, who is Bruce Lee's oh, I know. Uh, yeah, exactly. first student at IMB Academy. Very cool. Um, so I did that while I was in high school and then got into uh, Bagua and some of the Chinese internal arts as I as I got older and mellowed out. Man, you bit. definitely you definitely are. Th- okay, so now I got to ask this. If you, you for <laughs> like sure are an athlete, <laughs> where do you see that, that uh, athlete mentality of yours transfer over into the work that you do now? Yeah, I mean, are you it, competitive with what you do and uh, what you put out there? I mean, I'm super disciplined. I okay. mean, my wife jokes a lot with me. Like, I'm, I'm really like when I, I'm like a dog with a bone. You know, when I set my mind to something, um, it's hard to get me off that track. And I'm very disciplined and segmented with my time. I schedule everything out. I, I stick. I have no trouble sticking to a routine. Um, and I'm definitely performance oriented. So I've studied a lot of, um, you know, productivity, enhancement, time management. Like I'm always trying to 
up my game basically yeah. and perform mm. at the highest level that I can. I don't feel competitive in the sense of like, oh, this guy's got two million, you know, blog visits and I want to get mm. three million. I, I don't really approach it in that way. Um, so I think it's more just do you, discipline. Do you think that stems from a coach, a father figure? I mean, did somebody implement that in you early on? Uh, I mean, my dad was a was a really high achiever, and um, he was often my coach. With, you know, he coached a lot of our kid, you know, child before we got to a higher level, you know, basketball teams and stuff like that. And I always really appreciated um, his work ethic and the integrity with which he he uh, approached things. Um, but yeah, I think I th- I mean I think of my parents had a lot to do with it. They they really set high expectations for us, and we we always had those for ourselves. I have two brothers, and they've mm. they've been uh, similar in there. Can you see? Way. Can you see now as an adult where some of where some of those things have been a, a huge asset for you, and then where they've also potentially hindered you as an adult? Uh, absolutely, in both cases. I mean. Um, as I said, I think I've been able to accomplish a lot because of my um, focus on performance mm-hmm. um, and in all dif- uh, all of the areas of my professional life where that's important. Um, but in some ways, I mean, the the just going back a little bit into the, my early 20s and what happened there, uh, I was working in film and television actually in the in business and just working, you know, a lot, a lot of hours I was driven and, um, my life basically fell apart. Like I, I was young, I was in my early twenties. I had already bought a house, you know, I was on the fast track and, um, but I was just pushing myself relentlessly. And I got to the point where things just kind of fell apart. And, you know, looking back, it was a total blessing, but at the time it didn't really feel like a blessing. And, but I knew intuitively that the path that I was on was not the best path and that it was going to end in destruction. <laughs> where, where did you make that connection? Was it the Indonesia uh, thing? Or was it- so, no. So a, a bunch of things happened to me all at once, which were kind of like a sign that I took as a sign. So, um, I had bought a video camera, uh, where I was going to start to make my own movies. That was kind of one of my, my things. And, nice. um, and so that camera got stolen. My computer with, that had the, all the videos I had made crashed. And then my hard drive that I had back up crashed. And oh, I shit. lost all of that. It's a sign. My relationship, yeah. I had a girlfriend at the time. We broke up and, you know, kind of dis- disintegrated. Um, I quit my job. Like everything wow. just kind of fell apart. And I was like, wow, I have nothing. I have like no attachments and I'm just going to sell everything I own and go travel around the world for oh, a year. Shit. So I did that. I, you know, I got rid of everything. I rented out my house um, and then just took off. And I went mm. to Thailand first and I did a 30 day meditation retreat in the jungle um, above Chiang Mai, which was like my way of like, what's, what's the, yeah, <laughs> what's, what's the most going kind on? Of extreme yeah. way that I can like just, sit there and stare at the ground for like 30 days and try to figure this out. And so I was Which had to have been a hard transition from a guy who's like, like you said, like a dog and a bone. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I bet. No question. Like there's nothing that even comes remotely close to that. Wow. That first 30 day retreat. And, um, and then I stayed in Thailand for another few months and was continuing to study meditation and, and um, Thai massage, which was t- also a total departure from what I'd been doing before. And then I went to Indonesia and I was there for three months and that's when I got sick the first time, but I continued to travel um, because I got better at first from the, I took some antibiotics that I had in my medical kit. And then from there, I went to the Maldives, which are these islands off the coast of India. I went to South Africa, Madagascar, Mauritius, Reunion Island, and then back to Australia and then back home. And by the time I got back, I was a different person. I bet. You know, it was just everything that I had planned for my life before and that I think my mm, parents had completely. planned for me was just completely obliterated. And that began this 10-year journey that I talked about before, which was not just about recovering my health. It was also about figuring out what I was going to do with my life, you know, and how I was going to apply my internal resources in a way that um, 
served me better and served other people and, and, and kind of like get off of this treadmill of yeah. like this life that I feel like um, I was expected to live in some way or I expected of myself. And I, in a, looking back on that, it almost seems like the only way that I could have gotten off of that because of how much I, because I said I'm like a dog with a bone, yeah. was to, to be completely kind of destroyed, you know, to and where I rebuilt. had, yeah, yeah, and then rebuilt. That sounds as like well, an awesome movie. <laughs> as, <laughs> better than Point Break. You know? yeah. As a as a wise, well traveled traveled man, now what do you what do you see? I always say that your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness. What do you what do you still have to like catch yourself? Like you catch yourself going back to old habits or things kind of resurfacing where you have to be ah, I know that behavior, I know that pattern. Do you have those? Yeah, um, for me, it's definitely uh, a tendency to. Um, lose sight or, or just get too intense, you know, and, and work too much. Uh, I'm pretty good about maintaining work-life balance, but uh, I've come to realize that I'm I'm like a sprinter more than a marathon runner. Mm. So I can produce like really a lot in a short period of time, but then I need a lot of time to mm-hmm. just rest and integrate and recuperate. And my tendency over the past several years has been to sort of measure my own um, time spent against other people. You know, like, hey, it's a 40-hour work week, right? That's just what everybody does. So I should therefore be working, you know, 30 to 40 40 hours or 50 or 60 hours a week. Um, But what I've come to recognize is that that's not my rhythm and that's not the way that that I function best. And if I do that, I suffer, you know, my health, Mm -hmm. my health is now like, it's, it's like my, I'm the canary in the, in the coal mine, you know, it's like, it's, I start, I can recognize that I'm off track by physical symptoms starting to return. Oh, wow. Talk about those a little bit. What do you, what do you start to notice when you, cause I, you know, I could so relate to what you're saying right now and it's taken me years. I'm 36 years old, finally piecing this together. Now I have an incredible, and a lot of that's having an incredible partner I've been with for over six years. And she knows to just kind of let me do me. And I know that I'm a little out, out of balance and out of whack and going full speed for maybe a week or two. But then she also knows like, okay, I'm going to set book a trip for us to get away. Yeah. You know, phones yeah. go off, computer gets yeah. shut down. We're by water up in the trees, somewhere like that mm-hmm. and helps me get reconnected. And it's become extremely healthy for myself, for my relationship with her and others. What, what are some of the strategies or things that you do? Yeah, I definitely do that. I do regular um, digital detoxes, if you want to call them that, like you said. Uh, surfing is a big thing for me. So, like, you know, go to Nicaragua, just, you know, post up on the beach somewhere and awesome. turn everything off and just surf all day. I, my daughter's six now, and I'm, I'm she's getting into surfing. So oh, the cool. last time we were down in Nicaragua, she and my wife uh, – uh, we're surfing, um, you know, take, taking some lessons. I was getting them out there, which is amazing. I have, I, I try to do that throughout the week too. Sundays are like a Sabbath. I don't check, you know, I turn off phones and computers. Don't do that at all. I'm pretty, um, disciplined about that in general, even during the evenings. Um, I still do, I still meditate regularly. I've been doing that now for 25 years and it feels like a absolute lifeline to me. I, I think I would completely self-destruct if I didn't do that. Wow. Um, and, you know, I, I, 45 minutes is my target. And um, most days I get there, but some, you know, if I'm traveling or something, it's it's hard to do. Um, I'll, I'll just do what I can. You know, it could be five minutes or 25 minutes, uh, but that's been a bedrock for me. And um, my wife also is, is really... Um, a good, powerful uh, advocate for me in that way. She can recognize the the early signs yeah. often before I do, um, especially if I've got my head down and I'm yeah. really focused on something. Um, spending time with my daughter is is huge for me. Um, I've made that a priority, and we have uh, every Friday afternoon. I take the, the afternoon off, and I just we we have the what I call we call adventures. So we'll, oh, that's adorable. She's she's six, and so you know, a uh, cu- couple weekends ago, we went out to Stinson Beach and just hung out, and went surfing. Uh, last weekend, we went and um, or last Friday, we went and paid uh, to a pottery studio and did some, painted some pottery, and she had fun with that. And uh, 
We'll go sometimes to parks. You know, we just do, we went to the Children's Creativity Museum in San Francisco, which is a great place for kids. Um, and I just, you know, spending time with her is, if I apply the rocking chair test, you guys know what this no, is? No, no. So when I, if I ever have any question about what, whether to commit to something or what its relative level of importance is, I, I do the rocking chair test where I imagine that I'm 100 years old, sitting in my rocking chair, looking back on my life. And I think, how will I look back on you know, this question mm. <laughs> at that time? And if I think, you know, for example, will I regret, what will I regret more? You know, not taking on this new work project or spending the time with your daughter on this weekend or something. Friday, you know, giving up my Friday adventures with Sylvie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's never been anything yet that has um, trumped that trumped that, and led mm -hmm. me to think that I would look back from my rocking chair and, and not say that I, geez, yeah. I wish I wouldn't have spent so much time with my daughter. <laughs> you Reminds know? me of the, the giving tree. That <laughs> yeah. one hits me, uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, so, and I, and being with her, it's like, you know, just being fully present, turning off my phone, not responding to anything, just being totally present with her um, is uh, the, the best thing that I can do for her. But it's also, you know, for yourself, just too. for me. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the irony, too, of all of this is doing these things and understanding these things, you actually perform better also. Yeah. And I like to say that because we do have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to our show and a lot mm -hmm. of young kids who just want to grind it out and go crazy. And you can you can do that, but also recognize uh, that balance. Your body in balance will perform. Your body and mind in balance will perform far better than when they're out. So understanding that and tweaking those things, you'll, you're going to do better anyway. It's like trading dimes yeah. for quarters. I feel so passionate about that. I'm glad you brought that up because um, during this, like during the last three years, I've I my you know I've tripled the size of my clinic. Tr more than tripled the size of my staff. I'm running, you know, a, a training program for clinicians. We've trained hundreds of clinicians. I have blog, podcasts. I've written two books. You know, we're, I'm not slowing down. Like things mm -hmm. are growing and building. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet, you probably have time, more rest days. I work fewer hours. That's awesome. Yeah, I work fewer great. hours over that period of time. So I, I really challenge that idea. Like I read an article in the New York Times the other couple of weeks ago, maybe you guys saw it. I just want to throw something against the wall. Um, and I wrote an email to my, uh, to my pe people about this because it, it just drove me nuts. It was uh, about work culture in the Silicon Valley and about how you're looked at as like a loser if you don't work you know, 70 to 80 hour work weeks. To the point where Soylent is making its way exactly, back, right? Shit like exactly. that. Exactly. And there was a quote from a, a, an entrepreneur, I won't say his name, but you know, some people know him, um, where he said something like, you know, yeah, I, I don't have any time for my kids. I, you know, I don't I hardly ever see them, but that's just the cost of being successful. And I know what you're I, talking about. I yeah. just <laughs> absolutely think, uh, you know, that, makes me so angry <laughs> it's yeah. hard for me to even it's express it like yeah. and what is this guy doing he's making software that helps people visualize furniture in their home <laughs> what <laughs> so that's the important thing I, yeah. I wanted to send him the rocking chair test you know so imagine <laughs> yourself in your rocking chair and you, you you're gonna look back and be like wow that 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 that, that software, software that helped people visualize that coffee table in their living room <laughs> That was a game changer. I just yeah, think man. my kids hate me. <laughs> I don't know them at all, but I, I also, I'm so glad I did that. I also think it's just the false paradigm. Like it's like it when, people, false. when people approach us, chairs with made of gold. Well, it's yeah. like when people approach us with fitness, you know, and they say, you know, I know, you know, you guys talk about being healthy all the time, but I just want to look really good. Right. I just want to look aesthetic, and I yeah. and, and it's almost as if health and aesthetics are separate when in yeah. fact they're both one and the same. And this is one of those things where if you if you are in balance with yourself, and that means sometimes you gotta bust your ass too, because you can also be out of balance in the other direction. But being in balance both body and mind, you're gonna perform better and be able to produce more. Well doing Chris, that. Chris will appreciate what motivated us to do what we're doing here, which was what we saw. There is a huge problem within the the fitness community 
with programming and all the information that we're giving out there, the, the beast mode, the no days off and right. the, that mentality of like, you kill it. You know, you don't leave until you feel like you're going to die in a workout. And that could not be further from the truth of what's Resting? really going to give you <laughs> long term yeah. results. Sure. That type of that, that type of mentality might get you a, a, a faster along in two weeks time. But right. when you look at it like a year, two years, 10 years of your life, if you want overall health, long term longevity, that's not the approach at all. And so when we first came out with our programs, people just thought like, oh, this is too simple. It's too basic. I don't right. understand. There's only three days you're saying I have to be in the gym. Like, yeah, no shit. You ain't going to be in there seven days a week. Right. It's crazy where that what the, the it's very similar. The message and, that. Yeah. And two and a half years later now, we're getting emails from people like, oh, my God, oh, you're right. my yeah. body's responding yeah. like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, like it's, it's uh, I mean, I don't know. It's it's I think there's some deep cultural roots with the whole puritanical work ethic thing and um that are just martyrdom hard, uh, yeah yeah there's nothing right. there's nothing wrong with working it's the whole suffering that right. people could, they equate to work well like. and it's also not under not understanding the things that you're talking about here like periodicity mm-hmm. and and you know me also understanding different work styles like for me i figured out that i can accomplish a lot in a short period of time you know relative to maybe some other people not better or worse, just mm-hmm. the different, you know, t- t- tortoise versus the hare type of thing. And but in order to ha- to maintain that level of productivity, I need more rest and integration. I'm the same and, way. I, I used to mm-hmm. think I went through periods of hypomania, but I mean, really, it's just I get super um, passionate about something. Very inspired. passionate, very inspired, and I'll put out incredible <laughs> amounts of content in a very short period of time and ideas and whatever. Mm-hmm. And then it's like I need time now to yeah. to recharge and let yeah. that. So, Chris, m- moving forward, what's you have a book that's about to come out. Uh, let's talk about that for a second. What's your book going to be about? So the book is called Unconventional Medicine. And the premise of the book is chronic disease is the biggest challenge we face. But, <coughs> excuse me. But our current system is hopeless at addressing it. Um, as we've talked about before, it was it evolved during a time where acute problems were the were the biggest issue, and now we're trying to apply those same solutions to chronic disease, which just isn't working. Um, we have a system that's that's based on band aids, basically. I mean, if if you use an analogy, um, you have a rock in your shoe and it's causing your foot to hurt. If you go into the conventional system, you're going to get some ibuprofen and a and, and, a, <laughs> oh and, a, and a diagnosis of foot, such a great analogy of, of yeah. foot pain. Yeah, and don't <laughs> actually step so there'll much. be a more yeah. scientific term for it. It'll, it'll <laughs> you know it'll it'll sound more official oh than just cu- foot pain. Um, but of course, it makes a lot more sense to just take your shoe off and dump out the the rock, right? And and that's you know I propose a, a solution in the book that is focused around this approach of functional medicine, getting to the root cause of the problem is one component, has three components. The second one though is the ancestral diet and lifestyle. We, we have to recognize that environment is the primary driver of, of chronic disease. And this is, this is not just me making this up. I mean, there are studies that show that 85% of disease risk comes down to environmental and behavioral factors. So genes, yes, they play some role, but it's really people making the wrong choices about their diet and lifestyle on a daily basis that's driving this. And then the third thing is a, what I call a collaborative practice model. So um, we need doctors. We need doctors who are specialists, who can do a colonoscopy, who can do these specialized procedures, who can do doctory type of stuff. Absolutely, we need that. But what we need arguably even more now is an army of what I call allied providers. So these are health coaches, nutritionists, trainers, all kinds of people who can work intensively with folks on behavior and lifestyle changes. Because, you know, to use, uh, we talked about this before, the average appointment time is 10 minutes with a primary care doctor. There's no way if someone goes into the doctor and they've got multiple chronic problems going on, they're presenting with new symptoms, there's no way the doctor is even going to be able to figure that out, much less to spend time Mm -hmm. with that person, giving them the support they need to make meaningful changes that are going to last for a whole lifetime. They might give them like, as they're going out the door, you know, oh, remember, uh, eat eat a healthy diet. Yeah. Patients like on the way out, and you know, first of all, the doctor often doesn't even know what that is right. because they've taken one nutrition class in, in college or in medical school, if that. And second of all, if the patient just hears it as they're going out the door to 
go up to the front counter, they're not going to take that seriously. If, right. if 10 of the 10 minutes was spent talking about medication and then the last 10 seconds are spent mm-hmm. on diet and lifestyle change, they're not going to make a difference. Plus, it's behavioral change. I mean, I, I work with clients for years and sometimes it takes a year before Absolutely. things start Behavior to happen. Behavior change is hard, okay? <laughs> I mean, if it was easy, we wouldn't have the problems that we have. And, and yet... I wasn't trained in behavior change as, mm-hmm. as you know, a practitioner. I don't know. No doctors are trained in it. Um, and But yet there's tons of evidence that supports all of these principles of behavior change to make it successful. It's out there. We, we know how to apply it. But we just need to train people who can do that right. with, like, you know, folks like yourself and a whole bunch of other people who can be in that capacity and work intensively with people to make these changes because that's going to have a far bigger impact in terms of preventing and reversing chronic disease than just research, more research to find new drugs. Mm. That's awesome. It's funny yeah. because I, I trained a lot of doctors and I would tell them this, like, oh, we got to look at nutrition. And they'd say, yeah, no, of course. But I have patients who won't even take the fucking pill. They want to pill. answer right now. Right. They won't take the pills I give them. Like they'll forget mm-hmm. to take the medications and you want me to tell them to fix their diet. Yeah. It's you a know? systemic problem. Yeah. It's not the doctor's fault anymore. I mean, it, it's, it's they're victims of the system more than anybody yeah. else. Well, they're taught that way. They're, they're educated that way, right? They're taught that way. They're, if they're practicing within an HMO type of framework, they're often rewarded for seeing more patients and spending less time mm-hmm. with patients. Um, you know, that's efficiency in, in medical <laughs> speak. Um, and many doctors know this and they want to do something about it, but they don't know how mm. within the current framework and system. So... There are actually some really interesting things happen. This goes back to your question about, you know, are you seeing positive changes or are we going in the wrong direction? Um, there's a group called Iora Health in the Rocky Mountain area. It's a primary care group. And they basically went, approached some uh, uh, HMO, some insurance companies and said, give us your patients with diabetes or prediabetes. We have this new approach that's really effective and uh, we're going to, you know, reverse, we'll take your type 2 diabetics back to prediabetes or we'll take your prediabetics back to normal blood sugar. And if we achieve our goals, you pay us this much. If we don't achieve our goals, you don't pay us at all or you pay us less. This is called capitated payments. Mm -hmm. It's actually aligning incentive, you know, incentives Mm. with performance, which of course like happens in gyms and offices everywhere, everywhere else, everywhere else yeah. other than yeah. healthcare, right? <laughs> right? Where you're rewarded for not uh, performing. But that's anyway, right. that's a different topic. But, um, and then if they exceed their goals, they get more money. So what these, what they do, their approach, which is really amazing and smart, they just hire a huge number of health coaches, all from the communities in which the people <laughs> that they're serving. Mm-hmm. They, Brilliant. They, they don't hire them based on expertise and nutrition. This is a really interesting part. They hire them based on their ability to form a connection C- with their patients. Right? If you had asked yeah. me, I would have said, if, yeah. as, as coaches, as people who you, manage you, trainers, you I'll, know. that's the most important yeah. thing. Yeah. Number so one. they don't care anything about their background in nutrition. Wow. They're like, we can, we can teach them that. <laughs> right, yeah, right. We can we'll teach them it. that in yeah. like two weekends, you know? <laughs> so what they do is they have like a speed dating hiring process where oh, wow. they, they sit them down and they, you know, they have conversation with them and they have like undercover observers in the room apparently that are like watching how they interact with each other and you know in a way so they make sure they're hiring people who can relate because that's what it comes down to Mm -hmm. the the coaching relationship is about trust and um, the ability to to empathize and connect with your Mm -hmm. client and so then they train them give them the nutritional you know information they need and then these people work really intensively with the clients they go to their house they do pantry cleanouts they go shopping with them you know they they basically hold their hand through every step of the process and they still see the doctor occasionally they get the blood tests and if they need medication they get medication but this it's had dramatic impact they're taking people as i said back from type 2 diabetes not yeah. only even back to prediabetes awesome. but sometimes yeah. all the way back and they're they're just killing it. And I think those kinds of models are going to be what we need more of. How cost efficient is it? I mean, do you get very efficient? Yeah. Mm. Uh, The cost of treating a patient with type two diabetes is $14,000 a year. So imagine per patient per patient. Mm -hmm. So imagine now people are getting diagnosed earlier and earlier. Kids now are getting diagnosed with type two diabetes. So imagine someone who's diagnosed at even 30, and because of our, our modern technology, we can keep people alive for a really long time, right. even if they're living a low quality of life. So imagine that person spends 50 
uh, lives another 50 years until age 80. Uh, that, that they're spending, uh, I mean, that's well over half a million dollars, right? To treat this one single patient. Right. Yeah. So you want to talk about cost effectiveness. You could spend $5,000 on coaching and functional medicine testing and still have some left over. Right. And if you prevent diabetes in that patient from progressing, you've just saved the healthcare system half a million, half a million dollars. dollars for that one patient. Wow. God, so that's cool. This that, is, that's this is, that's yeah. what I talk about in the book is one of the common criticisms is like, oh, this is just, functional medicine is expensive. You know, the diet and lifestyle, this is, it's all expensive. And, and, and it's, that's only because everything is subsidized in the insurance care. Mm -hmm. If you go to the doctor and they give you, you know, this, this is what the conversation really should look like. That you'd be like, okay, you've got high cholesterol. So you've got two options. I, I can give you, you know, I can make diet and lifestyle recommendations, but you're on your own when it comes to implementing that. We have no support for you. <laughs> you you're going to pay all those costs out of pocket and good luck. Or I can give you this drug and good news is that's totally subsidized by the healthcare. You'll pay your $10 copay and, and, and you know, your numbers will come down. And the idea in that conversation is that those changes are equivalent. <laughs> you know, they, they might lead to the same number on the pa paper in terms of the cholesterol level, but they're not equivalent. Not at all. And they're not equal. If the, if the, co if the patient was paying the true cost of the drug and, and those costs were actually made clear, it would be cl it's so much cheaper to do the diet and lifestyle intervention, hire a coach to help them, and even do some additional testing up front to see what other mechanisms might be contributing to the high cholesterol and address those, and then save decades of you know subsidizing that person's medication. It's just so ridiculous to me that we look at our healthcare system and we're like, oh, we got to fix our healthcare system. It's the insurance programs, or it's we need a single payer because it's so expensive. And it's like nobody's talking about the elephant in the room, which is. We're getting sicker, yeah, yeah. and this shit's going to keep getting more expensive. Have to do so, right. And you can package it however you want. Some may be a little better than others, but at yeah. some point, it's going to fucking bankrupt us. That's we have to have our health. That's exactly the point I make in the book. I mean, I could have just you took the words right out of my mouth. It's like the 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 debate on ACA versus ACHA that we just went through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it matters. It's important. It affects people in real ways. So I'm not saying that that's not important. But I am saying that the problems that we have go much deeper than that. And there is no scenario that you can, that anyone can come. This is why it's so hard. Mm -hmm. There's no scenario in which we can use insurance to pay for the growing burden of chronic disease. Mm -hmm. As chronic disease increases, it will bankrupt us. I don't care if you have the Obamacare plan or the Trump plan or any other plan. There's no scenario in which we can be spending as much as we're spending on, you know, to cover each, we're spending $3.2 trillion a year. That comes down to 10, that's $10,000 for every man, woman, and child in the U.S. Man. And there's, there's no scenario in which we will be able to do that as the rates of chronic disease continue to increase. So just think about diabetes again, $14,000 a year. Just think of the impact of the average age of diagnosis going from 40 to 30. Add 10 years. That's it. 40, That's per it. Person. Game over yeah. right. for the whole healthcare system. If you do the math on that, you'll quickly see how that takes the three trillion to ten trillion and now we're more. Fucked. And that's it. Yeah. Bankrupt, game over. So it's really clear if you start thinking about this in a systematic way, it's absolutely clear that the problem is chronic disease. We have to figure out how to prevent and reverse chronic disease. Otherwise, our whole society is going to fall apart. It's not even just about healthcare. It's about the effects it's of about healthcare. surviving. Yeah, yeah. our yeah. society survive. I mean, how about having a government that functions and right. isn't completely bankrupt? Oh my God. So this is the motivation for this book for me. Like I, I, I think in the whole healthcare debate, it was so frustrating not to see that mentioned even once <laughs> in popular media. It's not in the conversation. Yeah. Not, at not at all. all. Well, uh, I appreciate you writing this book. I know people can pre-order it right now. Yeah, uh, it's. Uh, I'm not sure when this is happening, but okay. yeah, October 16th is is pre-order. It's unconventionalmedicinebook.com. Excellent. And then it comes out on uh, November 7th, and that will be you know on Amazon. Beautiful. We'll definitely yeah, have yeah. a link in the show notes and everything to drive everyone yeah. over there for and, sure. Uh, we, I really appreciate you coming on our show, Chris. Your information online mm -hmm. uh, is a lot of what you wrote. Um, a lot of the stuff that I found that you wrote in your videos 
uh, are the things that kind of pointed me in the direction that I am uh, today. So I want to thank you again for coming down. It's great to finally meet you. My pleasure, guys. Thanks very much. to talk with you and keep up the great work. I I really believe that people like, you know, the work that you're doing, as I said, is arguably the most important work we need to do because you're on the front lines working with people in an intensive way to get their diet and lifestyle in, in order. And that's going to have a bigger impact than anything else. So Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, check it out. Go to YouTube, subscribe to Mind Pump TV. There's a new video posted every single day. Also, go to mindpumpmedia.com. That's where you can find our 30 days of coaching and it's available for free. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.